Good evening, everyone. Uh, it give, my name is Ahlam Duhal, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of King Fahad Specialist Hospital to our webinar today. Uh, our webinar was titled as Radiation Oncology for Surgeon, but it, uh, because they are the one who share the decision and outcome for our patients. But it actually meant to be beneficial for all healthcare providers, since we don't get uh, exposed enough to radiation therapy during our medical school or the uh, training after that. Um, radiation therapy in the recent days had uh, become very sophisticated as the advancement in the technology directly reflected as an improvement in the way of uh, delivering radiation treatment with minimal effect. Um, for that, we thought uh, we would uh, bring you today through our lectures to the um, recent and modern art of uh, radiation treatment. Um, in the next, uh, which we, we hope that it will be uh, just the beginning for a series of more site-specific educational sessions for uh, radiation oncology. Um, let's uh, start our program for today, and uh, uh, thank you for registering with us, and uh, I hope it will be beneficial for all of you. Dr. Adnan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear uh, uh, brothers and sisters in uh, surgery and in radiation oncology. Thank you very much for joining us in the uh, rule of radiation therapy in surgery. And uh, it will be rich of your comments and your uh, questions as well. Uh, needless to say that I was a surgeon two years before I changed to radiation, on, uh, to radiation oncology, yes. So I knew exactly how we think. Believe me, the brain of the radiation in oncology exactly like the brain of the surgeons in everything. So let's start uh, uh, this uh, evening with the uh, introduction. Uh, to the uh, radiation oncology. Dr. Ahlam al-Duhal, thank you very much for this arrangement. And she's going to talk about the basic of radiation oncology, which is very important for the surgeon. Please, Dr. Ahlam al-Duhal. Dr. Ahlam al-Duhal, the head uh, section of the radiation oncology at King Fahad Specialist Hospital, one of the busiest hospital in this, uh, Saudi Arabia. Please, Dr. Ahlam. Thank you, Dr. Adnan. All right, so today I will be talking, I will introduce you to the basics of radiation oncology. Um, I will take you through the biology and physics, which is really important and to understand the dose and fractionation and the logic behind the radiation therapy. And then I will take you to the, I will talk about the patient journey in the radiation oncology department. And finally, I will uh, some mention some facts and limitation of radiotherapy. So uh, radiation, the speciality is called radiation oncology because we mainly treat uh, malignant tumors, but sometimes we treat benign as well. Uh, where we use radiation th therapy, which is the art of using ionizing radiation, which is high energy X-ray, uh, like the one we use for chest X-ray, directed at the tumor to destroy malignant cell while being able to minimize the damage to the surrounding normal tissue. The aim is to deliver precisely measured dose of radiation to a defined tumor volume, resulting in eradication of the tumor. Uh, we I, I want to remind you that we are using ionizing radiation in the form of photon therapy or particle therapy, which is electron or protons, which is different than the non-ionizing radiation we're using in our daily life. Uh, now I will start with the biology. So I will introduce you to the term radiosensitivity, which is the measure of a tumor radiation response, those describing the degree and speed of regression during and immediately after radiotherapy. And it's a very important term. That term, that radiosensitivity gets affected by many factors. One of the most important factor is histological time. Uh, we know that some tumors are highly sensitive to radiation, like lymphoma and seminoma while others are highly resistant to radiation uh, therapy, which we call radio resistance, like melanoma. And uh, so no matter how much we increase the dose in case of melanoma, we rarely see any effects because the tumor by, its, by nature is radio resistance. The other factor is oxygen concentration in the tumor cell and the sensitivity to radiation decrease in hypoxic state. If a solid tumor outgrow its blood supply, it will become two to three times more resistant to radiation therapy. And finally, where are we at the cell cycles? Cells are more sensitive at a dividing phase. And if you go back to your basic biology, 
the cells are actively uh, dividing at G2 and mitosis phase. Uh, so radiation kills cells that are actively dividing, and it may take days to weeks, depending on the type of cell. And that explains why we see it effect on the skin, bone marrow, or intestines uh, quickly, while we see the effect later on the less dividing cell like bone. Uh, so what happened when we fire a beam to a tumor? Our primary target is the DNA. And the radiation will cause lethal damage, which is double strand break, or sublethal damage that will lead to a reproductive cell death apoptosis. Uh, fortunately, the normal cells have the mechanism for repairing. And just notice that I'm putting repairing in red. It has the ability to repair sublethal damage which will lead to minimize side effects on a normal tissue because normal tissue has the ability to repair. While cancer cells cannot repair sublethal damage compared to most healthy cells, and that is beneficial as well because since cancer cells division decrease and then the tumor die. So the four R's of radiotherapy, which is very important concept, uh, I will explain it more in the next slide, which is repair, which will take, the cells will take few hours to repair itself re-oxygenate re to become more sensitive to radiation and then redistribute into the cell cycles and then repopulate. And those four R's are the basics for the dosage. So that's why we don't give the radiation in one shot. We divide the dose or we split it up into what we call fractions over time. So we give time for the normal cells to repair itself and recover and the tumor cells to become less efficient. So a radiation oncologist will adjust the amount of radiation given by considering histology, location of the cancer, and I want you to think about the normal surrounding structure and the radiation entry and exit and the side effects accordingly. And whether the radiation therapy is given to a tumor or after surgery to a tumor bit. And um, I want to tell you that the absorbed dose is measured in a unit we call a gray, and a typical prescription will look like this, 50 gray into 25 fractions, five days a week over five weeks, because we don't give through the weekend and the minimum between any fraction should be eight hours. So we give time for the four hours to work. So the radiation therapy is the art of balancing the radiation dose to be able maximum to humor control with a minimal normal tissue toxicity. That would be it for biology, and I don't want to complicate it more. I will move now to physics. So radiation therapy physics is responsible for the precision and accuracy of a treatment by using advanced computer calculation to create individual patient treatment plan. And this is the main treatment, the main treatment machine in any radiation oncology department, which we call linear accelerator. And sometimes you will hear us saying LINAC. And the LINAC has, the parts of the LINAC is the stand, the treatment uh, couch, and then the treatment gantry. And in the gantry, the most important part are the imaging system, which we use for daily imaging review, and the treatment head. So using the LINAC, we ensure precise delivery because the gantry rotate, the couch as well rotate, and the patient, we put the patient immobilized on this couch. And I want you to look at the treatment head here because I'm gonna just explain a little bit more because it's really important part of the um, treatment machine. So uh, a magnific magnificent uh, picture of that is in the next slide. Uh, we have what we call a multi-leaf collimeter system. So this is just like looking at the treatment head. So it's a system made of lead, uh, millimeter thickness, three millimeter thickness jaws, movable jaws, that it moves uh, to give to match the shape on the target volume and protect the surrounding normal tissue. Uh, now I'll move to the main types of radiation therapy, uh, which is external beam radiotherapy, where the patient will lie down and external source of radiation is directed at the body. So you have to think if a radiation coming here, then what is the path the radiation will take to hit the target or what's the organ that it will go through to hit the target. And then accordingly, this will, will produce side effects for our patients. 
And then another type is the brachytherapy, where a radiation um, where a radiation device will be applied inside a cavity, and then the radiation source will travel to that uh, device, deliver the dose, and go back to its incubator. Uh, as opposed to external beam radiotherapies, this therapy has the precise placement at the sur of the tumor, and the radiation only affects the area where the exposure to nearby tissue is reduced. So you would tell me, so your the brachytherapy is less toxic to the surrounding tissue than why we don't use it for all the tumor, because it has the limitation that we have to place it in a cavity or interstitial tissue, which we cannot apply in any other part of the body. We usually use it for gynecologic cancer, prostate, sometimes esophagus, uh, esophagus or uh, bronchitis. Uh, now, um, I will explain the patient journey inside the radiation oncology department. And this is a crucial part because uh, I want you to know what happens after the first consultation uh, so you would understand the importance for time of referral because sometimes we receive the patient too early or too late. So after the consultation, we set an appointment for patient uh, simulation. And then after that, the patient will just go home and come back after 10 days or two weeks uh, to receive the first fraction of radiotherapy, which is here, the gray one. What happened in between is a multi-step involving mul uh, multiple um, people working on what we call a treatment plan to produce uh, and be able to introduce a safe um, radiation therapy. And I will take you through those steps. So first step is sim simulation. And a CT simulator is the standard for planning. The patient will get a tattoo and um, he will use, we will use that tattoo with a laser system at the CT, matching the laser system at the treatment machine to put the patient at the same position every day. We want to ensure that the patient is at the same position every day, which will take us to a mobilization and positioning, which is a very crucial part of radiation treatment uh, to ensure accurate delivery of the prescribed radiation dose and to spare the surrounding critical structure. Remember that we are giving a daily treatment. We want to ensure that we're hitting the same target every day. Uh, the primary goal is the reproducibility of the position, reduced positioning error, and the reduced time for daily setup. So I'm giving you an example of, for a breast uh, cancer patient getting treatment using what we call uh, the uh, breast board. And the one in pink here is what we call a prone breast board. I just want to show you if uh, we chose, put the patient in the right position and we chose the right immobilization device, how that will affect uh, the, uh, the, do the dose to the normal tissue. Because here in the supine, you can see that there is marked uh, dose going to the lung and the heart. Once we change the patient to the prone position, you can see that almost there is no dose received by the lung and heart. So I he here I saved the normal structure just by uh, ch changing the position and using the right immobilization device. So we choose the right immobilization device and then, uh, and then uh, we, we start simulation. This is another example of um, immobilization devices, what we call a backlog, which is basically body mold. And this is what we call face mask, and we use it for CNS and hidden neck tumors. So when, once, as I said, once we put the patient in the right position, uh, we choose the right immobilization device, and then a CT scan is obtained at the time of simulation, then those images will be imported into the treatment planning computer. And the radiation, uh, uh, the, the physicist will work on them and then will send it for a radiation oncologist to, to do the contouring. And it's a very important part, which this part takes good time of our, good amount of our time as a radiation oncologist. Uh, we, uh, the contouring, we decide what is the target volume we want to hit by radiation and what are the critical structures surrounding that the tar target volume we want to avoid. And then we start drawing that slice by slice to make a volume. So here, uh, and usually we, we, uh, do, we don't do that empirically. We just use um, uh, contouring atlases. And one of the most important one are RTOG contouring atlas. There is other multiple references. 
Um, at the end, we create a volume, which is the red one, which we call the target volume. The red arrow here represents my target volume. So I tell my therapist, I tell my planner that I want to hit the target with the maximum dose and then uh, surround the normal structure. If you can see here that we draw the rectum completely, we draw the bladder, we draw as well the small intestine. And then the, we, the planner will work on uh, uh, give it on, on multiple plans. Sometimes he gives me multiple plan and I have to review it and approve which plan we want to use. And the better the plan, the more coverage for the target volume and the less uh, radiation going to the um, a normal structure. Uh, after that, he will um, do a quality assurance, second physics check and then uh, he will uh, send it to machine for treatment delivery. And uh, then, uh, and, and here you can see that uh, we, avoided, uh, hit, we avoided giving radiation from posterior part because we want to avoid the, um, the rectum, which is very sensitive. Uh, but you can see that still there is good dose because this is the exit dose. Uh, this is um, a sample a schematic diagram of simplified radiation treatment chain. And you can see that there is multiple people working with multiple, st multiple steps involved to reach the new start uh, here. So that's why we take time to deliver any radiation treatment and we cannot simulate the patient today and treat tomorrow, except for palliative cases that is very simple. Uh, I will he finally, I will correct some myths and uh, give you some facts about radiation treatment. The treatment is not painful. It's always given over several minutes and similar to having an x-ray examination. The patients need to be cooperative uh, because he has to stay immobile for 10 to 15 minutes. So delirious patient, agitated, those patients, we need to think before giving them radiation. Uh, the side effects are usually local and the patients are not radioactive after treatment. Finally, though it's a good treatment, but it has its own limitation. Uh, one, of them, uh, one of them is life expectancy, as there is no immediate relief with radiation. It often take one to three weeks to notice maximum improvement. The life expectancy should be at least a month. Uh, and if there is diffuse involvement of a critical organ, like the liver or lung, radiation does not work well, as it will cause deterioration of the function of that organ, except for the brain. That was my presentation for today. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dohal, for the uh, excellent uh, basic science of radiation oncology. I think you make the uh, job very difficult for Dr. Shakir Shakir to comment about the introduction to radiation oncology. You did an excellent one. Uh, so uh, I think because we are a little bit late, we maybe we'll go with the Dr. Shakir Shakir, and then we'll take the discussion. Uh, Thank you because they are covering the basic science and introduction to radiation oncology. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shakir Shakir, consultant uh, radiation oncology at King Fahad uh, Specialist Hospital in Dammam. He can present this uh, topic in, in France, if you like, but uh, please, yeah, a lot of people asking uh, whether there is any translation, I think from the YouTube channel, asking if there is any Arabic translation, we told them no. Uh, I don't think we are prepared for that, but if they want it in France, Dr. Shakir Shakir, he did his training in, uh, in in France, so he can do it in France if you like. But uh, go ahead, Dr. Shakir Shakir from King Fahad Specialist Hospital and his topic, Introduction to Radiation Oncology. Okay. All the best. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction and the, uh, the opportunity, and thank you very much for the attendee as well. Uh, I will pass through a continuation of what uh, my colleague, Dr. Ahlam, did uh, previously. Uh, I will avoid duplication. So, uh, uh, as part of the uh, main theme of my presentation, I will pass uh, through a couple of points. Uh, as an introduction, uh, we know that the radiotherapy is... Uh, uh, ...sometimes abbreviated as RT or uh, as part of cancer treatment to control or kill malignant cells, usually by using an accelerator. Sometimes we use it with, uh, for non-cancer uh, context. And sometimes we are not using a linear accelerator and other devices. Just this is just a general uh, a general rule. Uh, so again, the aim of radiotherapy is to deliver a prescribed dose of radiation to a target volume, usually a cancer cell, while sparing and minimizing dose to normal cells, which is the healthy tissue. Uh, from an application point of view, radiotherapy could be classified as Dr. Halam said. 
uh, either an external beam radiotherapy, which is where the source of radiation is uh, externally away from the patient, or, or by brachytherapy, where the uh, radiation source is in direct contact to the patient, either to the skin or inside. I will pass through some details through those two uh, techniques. Uh, the external beam radiotherapy, previously called teletherapy or Rontgen therapy, uh, could use uh, a kilovolt energy, uh, previously called ortho voltage treatment. Uh, and this uh, applicator, depict, this picture depicts this type of uh, treatment for superficial tumor. Uh, Mr. Shaker, please, your presentation is not sharing. Can you share your presentation, please? We can see your face, but not your talks. Uh, share, share, share the yeah. screen. Okay, is it shared? Uh, not yet. I wish if you could talk. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's going. Yes, now. This one, uh, you, can, you can see the pointer in the, uh, in the, because I have two screens. Uh, we can see the slide, but I think we need to maximize it. Yes, uh, can you uh, maximize it? Shaker, please, if you're allowed, if, if you allowed to me, please. Yes. Can you stop sharing and start from the scratch? I will stop sharing now. Please, can you go for share screen? Share screen. And uh, it will, you will see the box. From the box, don't use, yeah. Okay, yes, great. Yes, now, very clear. Okay, uh, so again, uh, I will just pass through on the previous uh, three slides. Um, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, the types of uh, external beam radiotherapy is could be classified into uh, either orthovoltage uh, therapy, which is kilovolt, used for uh, superficial tumors, as uh, this machine uh, depicted in this uh, photo. Uh, the electron therapy is a part of external beam radiotherapy, uh, and then there is uh, a usual uh, megavolt therapy, which is depicted in the next slide. Uh, previous historically, we used to use the uh, uh, natural source cobalt 60 to deliver the external beam radiotherapy. But nowadays, most of our machines are using uh, an X-ray tube to deliver the external beam radiation. Uh, the other type of therapy has some sort of uh, uh, specifications. Uh, it could be classified according to the uh, dose rate to either high dose rate where there is a delivery of radiation in multiple sessions, usually spaced by weeks or low dose rate, where there is a placement of radioactive source inside the tumor permanently, like, for example, the prostate cancer. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, techniques, as Dr. Halam previously mentioned, mostly uh, the brachytherapy is implicated in uh, uh, gynecologic malignancies. We call it the intracavitary uh, treatment. Sometimes we might use it for uh, other uh, indications, like, for example, rectum and esophagus. We call it intraluminar. Sometimes we place the, uh, uh, the applicators inside the tissue, where we call it interstitial, as for example, for the base of the tongue, for the anal canal, and for the breast boost. Uh, another type of uh, brachytherapy called surface mold. Go ahead. Therapy, which is called contact therapy for eye or for ocular malignancies like for example, the ruthelium plaques. Uh, as part of uh, technology, there is a, a type of radiotherapy called intraoperative radiotherapy, which is you, which uh, uh, deliver the large dose of radiation as a single fraction inside uh, the tumor bed during surgery. Uh, I put here two photos, one of them using electron beam, the other used like uh, um, the, uh, direct, uh, could, could be classified as part of uh, uh, contact therapy. Uh, uh, in terms of clinical indication, we can classify radiotherapy to two main categories uh, as part of intent. We know that more than two-thirds of uh, our cancer patients might need radiotherapy at a certain time, point in their life. So in terms of intent of uh, treatment, uh, it could be either curative or palliative. Curative treatment could be either radical uh, radiotherapy or in multimodality as either new adjuvant before surgery or adjuvant after. Those two types could be either radiotherapy alone or concurrent radiochemotherapy. I call it radiochemotherapy rather than chemo radiotherapy. Uh, in terms of technique, external beam radiotherapy uh, historically used as uh, 2D. I will show the developmental milestone of those techniques uh, as we go on. Uh, uh, just to keep in our mind the, the, pic the picture that previously depicted by uh, my colleague, Dr. Ahlam, 
the uh, the multi lift collimator is the uh, the exit of the radiation from the radiation machine and these multi uh, leaflets as uh, are uh, moving in synchron synchronization to shape the uh, the beam that is exited from the uh, machine and we have to uh, keep in our mind also using the gantry movement the head of the radiotherapy machine movement in conjunction with movement of factors we could deliver radiation therapy in many uh, techniques and this is coming in the, in the next slides uh, this is just historical uh, pictures of uh, how we used to treat uh, nosopharyngeal carcinoma with 2d techniques where there is like uh, uh, opposing fields uh, and uh, now uh, and then after that there is like uh, an evolvement of using 3d conformal radiotherapy to shape the uh, uh, radiation field coming outside the uh, machine to sh uh, for the uh, uh, to shape the same perspective of the mach of the tumor uh, at the at the at the exact angle. So there is a sort of beam shape modulation. Uh, uh, we can uh, appreciate that uh, historically the 2D radiotherapy looks like a box technique. With the introduction of 3D conformal radiotherapy, there is some sort of modulation of the shape to comfort the tumor uh, volume. And the, in the next slide, if we try to modify the intensity of the beam inside the field itself, we have what we call it IMRT or intensity modulated radiotherapy, where the intensity of the beam inside each field is not the same. I mean, each field of radiotherapy is divided into sub-small units. Each one has its different intensity of uh, radiation. Uh, this is produced by the uh, synchronized movement of multi-lamp collimator. Uh, if we imagine that there is a movement of uh, multi-lamp collimator together with the gantry rotation, we can introduce to you the uh, subsequent technique, which is going to come in the next slide. This is uh, just to show you how the involvement of radiation field is coming through from 2D to 3D to IMRT. We can appreciate that there is much less exposure of radiation to normal tissue as compared to the previous old technique. For example, this is a good photo to show you that this is the target that we want to irradiate. Previously, we are obligated to irradiate all these unnecessary normal tissue inside this box. With introduction of 3D, uh, the, uh, the unnecessary irradiation reduced, but still, uh, with the introduction of IMRT, much less uh, radiation is uh, concentrated to the tumor with sparing of normal tissue. Uh, if we move to the next slide, showing the next uh, generation, which is the VMAT, volumetric modulated arc therapy, we can easily appreciate that the uh, the shape of the radiation volume in, uh, in IMRT is good, but with the VMAT, it's much better. Uh, there is less, less exposure of radiation to normal tissue because the uh, multi lamp is moving and the, also the treatment machine is rotating continuously, delivering the treatment continuously as an arc. So uh, this is uh, the technique that mostly used uh, nowadays. Uh, all of these techniques, we are mentioning it to show you the, uh, the evolvement of the technology in radiation therapy to reduce the toxicity to normal tissue and at the same time maximizing the radiation only to the cancer cells between brackets, the target volume. Uh, more recently, uh, an introduction of a new technique called stereotactic radiotherapy, where it generally implies to deliver high dose of radiation in a limited number of fraction. Uh, this technique is, uh, has a high precision to uh, spare a normal tissue and concentrate the radiation dose to be deposited only to the, uh, as much as we can to the target tissue. Uh, we can classify it clinically either to cranial spinal or corpora. The cranial spinal uh, stereotactic radiation could be either delivered in single fraction, and now we call it stereotactic radiosurgery, or in multiple fractions, usually from two to five fractions, and then at this point we call it stereotactic radiotherapy. SBRT is the uh, uh, is the cousin of uh, stereotactic radiotherapy to the uh, to the rest of the body, and usually it is used with 4D technique, which which we're gonna talk about later. Uh, so, in terms of machine, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy could be delivered formerly uh, using a gamma knife, and there's two new machines, the cyber knife and the LINAC, both of them equivalent to deliver stereotaxy to, uh, with, the, with, the, with the comparable clinical uh, outcome. Uh, to do so, we need uh, an accurate 
imaging verification to make sure that the patient is in the correct position with uh, with imaging using either uh, uh, imaging machine uh, uh, embarked on the same treatment uh, machine, or uh, independent imaging uh, embarked on the on the on the room in the room itself. Uh, the 4D is uh, a technique of radiation uh, where we take into account the time factor. I mean, the physiological movement. For example, I'm showing you here a picture that a tumor in the lung uh, is delineated here, but at certain point in respiratory cycle, this movement, this tumor is in another position. So if we didn't take into account this movement variability, we are not delivering the exact uh, dose uh, of radiation to the to the tumor itself. So this is the concept of 4D, where we either deliver the radiation to a volume that uh, encompass all possible tumor positions, or using a gating uh, technique, which is delivering the radiation only in a specific phase of respiration by uh, turning on and off the treatment machine during the respiratory cycle in synchronization with the respiratory movement. Uh, I will pass through uh, with some details of uh, uh, treatment uh, types of radiotherapy in terms of fractionation. Usually, why do we fractionate? As we mentioned previously, to maximize the effect of radiation to cancer and minimize negative side effects to normal tissue. Why? Because usually normal tissue has better mechanism of repair rather than cancer cells, which is usually busy on division rather than repair. So first fraction, both cell types are affected. Normal cells got their uh, way to repair, but cancer cells have as a repair mechanism less efficient than normal tissue, and with subsequent uh, fractions, tumor cell dies, or the tumor generally die, and the normal tissue got recovered. Uh, in terms of definitions, uh, the types of fractionation is depending on multiple factors, mainly the total time of radiotherapy course, whether it is four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and the interval between fractions, days or uh, more than that. Also, the total dose of radiation and the equivalent dose and the dose per fraction as well. And here I will show you some definitions of uh, those uh, terminology. Hypofractionation is to deliver higher dose in fewer visits. Hyperfractionation is delivering the same dose, total dose into more visits. For example, we might deliver two fractions per day by reducing the dose per fraction. Taking into account the total time is the same as standard radiation. What we this is not used anymore, uh, especially under small certain circumstances. Uh, this is just a, a technical terminology to show you this is the standard fractionation, uh, accelerated hyperfractionations where there is delivery of more than one fraction per day, even including the weekend. There is what we call it protracted hyperfractionation. For example, one of the best uh, radiotherapy protocol is delivering radiation once per week. Uh, so we call it hyperfractionated hypo protracted uh, protocol. Uh, it is just uh, a touristic slide. Uh, now we move through uh, some main, uh, main concepts in radiation oncology, the volume definitions. We have what we call it GTV, which is the gross tumor volume, clinically visible. And then we have the clinical target volume, which is a little bit bigger volume than GTV, keeping uh, taken into account the subclinical disease. So by adding a biological margin, depending on the type of the tumor. So CTV must equal GTV plus a biological margin. And then we have the PTV, which is the main treatment volume. We call it planning treatment volume, which is uh, adding a setup margin to include a setup error and variability in the position. So by definition, PTV must equal CTV plus setup margin. Uh, when we introduce the concept of 4D, we have what we call it ITV, the internal target volume, which is adding the internal margin to include the physiological movement and variabilities. So by definition, ITV equal CTV plus internal margin, and then by consequence, PTV will equal ITV plus setup margin. Uh, this is a small photo to depict what I have explained previously, the types of volume. Uh, and most of the techniques that we are using is to reduce the uh, uh, unnecessary uh, setup margin to be as small as we can in order to reduce the uh, exposed uh, normal tissue to radiation. 
In terms of image verification modality, historically we use what we call it clinical verification based on surface anatomy. But nowadays in the presence of uh, new technology, we have what we call image guided radiotherapy, IGRT, which is the use, which is used to reduce uncertainties and by consequence reducing the setup margin to the treatment field. So less volume of radiation and then less toxicity. There is many types of uh, uh, IGRT. I will not pass through all of them, just I will take the important one. Uh, for example, this is just a, a touristic slide to show how, how many techniques we have in terms of IGRT. So the electronic portal image is uh, an, a capture, X-ray capture, uh, placed opposite to the treatment machine and taking the image, uh, we call it megavolt image, and compare it to the reference image uh, representing the position of uh, acquisition during simulation and matching them together, making sure that they are uh, within the tolerance of uh, variability. Another technique we call it onboard imaging, where the uh, image verification is placed embarked in the same treatment machine. There is two types. There is what we call it kilo voltage imaging and uh, CBCT, which is a miniature uh, CT scan uh, to do uh, to take a small CT scan and compare it with matching with the, with the uh, original reference CT scan simulation and matching them together and correct the, uh, the, the displacement. We can appreciate the quality of image of X-ray, uh, I mean, the, of the kilo volt is much better than the megavolt. Uh, so, uh, I will move now to the side effect. I will not pass through details and side effect. I will just uh, mention some uh, uh, main uh, general concept. Normal tissue, as we said, has better healing uh, than tumor cell, but still there might be a damage. The art of radiation oncology is to balance those probability. Uh, so, we control tumor more than we uh, affect healthy tissue. A radiation oncologists are willing to accept some sort of mild side effect in front of controlling the tumor or uh, uh, having a curative uh, intent, but if the risk is higher, usually the radiation uh, the radiation therapy is declined at the, in this context. Uh, this is a very nice slide. Uh, it shows two curves. One of them represent the tumor. The other one, the dotted one, represent the uh, the normal tissue. Uh, in our daily practice as oncologists, we want to shift this curve as much as we can to the left side. So we want to make the tumor more sensitive by using, for example, radio sensitizer, and we want to shift the normal tissue. If you tissue. allow me, uh, Shakir, can you conclude within one minute? Yes, uh, I, I, need only I need only two minutes. Uh, and we need to shift the right dotted uh, curve to the right by protecting the normal tissue. Uh, so the role of uh, radiotherapy team is to maximize, as we said, the dose to the target and minimize it to the organ at risk. Uh, in terms of chronology, we classify the toxicity either to acute within less than six months and late to more than six months. Uh, for grading system, uh, we use what we call CTCEA, the common terminology criteria for adverse effects. The other one is not usually used, but uh, just to mention them. Uh, and as a rule of thumb, we can classify the toxicity from uh, as a grading from zero to five. Usually when there is a grade three toxicity, there is a procedure must be done. And uh, at, the, at this point, radiotherapy might be uh, stopped for a while until the patient got fully recovered. Um, uh, an example of mucositis, uh, I will leave it for the specific presentation in my, with my colleagues. And another uh, example of toxicity to the skin, I will leave it also to one of my colleagues in terms of uh, treating the toxicity. So the take home, the take home measures, uh, prevention. Oh, we didn't hear. Hello? Go ahead now. Yeah. Uh, so, a new technology helped, Dallas, helped a lot dramatically to reduce the severity of the side effect and uh, prevent uh, radiotherapy interruption. We have to listen carefully to our patient and assist them thoroughly uh, during radiation treatment if they need any help uh, and management of their toxicity. Uh, and by this slide, I would uh, conclude the, uh, my presentation and just to keep in our mind that radiotherapy uh, uh, treatment is a team uh, play. So we have radiation oncologists, we have radiotherapists, we have... We have dosimetrists, we have radiation physicists, we have all of them coordinating together in a nice harmony to produce the best uh, management quality for our precious patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakir. Uh, 
you and Dr. Dahal discuss all the radiation oncology. I don't think the rest of the group can add more. Oh, no, but, no, of uh, <laughs> Dr. Majd Al Uthman, uh, uh, he will be the next speaker, really. Uh, before uh, I go to the next speaker, there is only one question came through the net, uh, which is about the uh, maximum dose can be delivered to the uh, uh, pelvis. And uh, I told the the, uh, the, uh, the one who uh, sent this question that this will be answered by Dr. Uh, Reem al Ujami in the, the presentation at 8.40, insha'Allah ta'ala. She will talk about the role of radiation therapy in gynecological malignancies. Uh, so just in summary, I want to summarize it for the surgeon. I know I was a surgeon. I like uh, the point very clear. Radiation is energy causing ionization in the atom. This will damage the DNA the normal cell will repair, the cancer cell will die. And the, the normal cell will show some toxicity and this will be recovered. The cancer will be cured. And the rest of the discussion is a new technologies came to the era of radiation oncology, make it much, much, much easier to the patient, difficult to the doctors, make the toxicity much less and the cure rate much high because we can now deliver high dose of radiation therapy more than before. And this is really a good introduction to my colleague, Dr. Majid al Uthman, head section of radiation oncology at Johns Hopkins Aramco Healthcare in uh, Dhahran. And he's, uh, 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 needless to say, he's my boss at the beginning and he's my teacher, wallahi. Uh, really, I said he's my teacher. And he's the best person who's going to talk about the breast radiation therapy in 2020. And uh, he will summarize all the technology. Please be ready for uh, tough knowledge and no no actually he will make it much much simpler than you think uh, please my my boss dr Majid al rahman assalamu alaikum uh, thank you so much for the nice introduction uh, dr al hibshi uh, and uh, speaking about the most common uh, cancer that we deal with uh, we start uh, with uh, the radiation uh, therapy to the uh, breast uh, so uh, let me just see if I can move the talk and I will make it uh, so simple. You know, bottom line, radiotherapy is developing high energy beams into a target volume of tumor and sparing the critical normal structures. So if you look at your left, you can have a beam that's coming out of a machine and we call it external beam to the target or if you look to your right, you can have a radioactive uh, material delivered by a machine into the volume, and we call it internal beam. It could be called bracket therapy as well. So, uh, but there is diversity in radiation therapy practice. Uh, it's, you know, we are all apples, but we have different flavors. And it can be due to difference, difference in training backgrounds uh, by the specialists, we also have some gray areas in evidence in which we don't have definite answers and different people will do different things. Also, uh, different places have different uh, resources in terms of technology. Some people have a certain machine and can do certain things, others don't. So this can also define the practice. Also variable expertise. Some of us have done some fellowships in certain sites and have more experience in certain areas. Or it can be just like we are human beings, pure bias. We do it because this is the way we learned it and this is the way we'll do it. Um, now, uh, as you know, surgery is the mainstay of breast cancer treatment. And uh, we radiation oncologists don't treat usually gross disease except in palliative cases. In curative cases, we treat subclinical disease, which is the microscopic disease and we receive the patient after surgery. And we have two areas of focus. If you look to your left, we we'll, uh, focus on the primary site, which is the breast, and we can uh, preferably do breast conservation surgery in which we only remove the uh, tumor and leave the rest of the breast tissue. And so the target would be the whole breast, or also we can target the tumor as well. Or, certain patients are not candidates for breast conservation. So we have to remove the whole breast, which is mastectomy. And then certain patients, not all mastectomy patients need radiation therapy, but some patients with high risk features might need radiation uh, therapy. Now, of course you can have the chest wall 
or the chest wall after immediate reconstruction. Um, on your right, uh, the other target is the lymph nodes. And uh, uh, as you know, after sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is SLMB here, uh, which is minimal sampling of uh, uh, lymph nodes in the axilla after injecting a radioactive material. Um, and uh, uh, you can see plus minus a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Sometimes, as you know, now with an advent of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, uh, we have to deal with certain situations. Also, it could be after axillary lymph node dissection, which is more extensive uh, lymph node removal, also plus minus neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and we have certain unsampled lymph nodes. And uh, we'll talk about this later. Uh, so just to uh, summarize, this is the patient comes for simulation. The patient, we obtain CT images that uh, show us where critical structures are, like the lung, the heart, all the levels of the axilla and the chest wall or breast. Uh, we make some tattoos as references on the skin of the patient. And then once we have this, we do the contouring that Dr. Ahlam and Dr. Shaker spoke about. We contour all the critical structures, you know, the target, the tumor bed, the critical structures, the lung, the heart, the, the uh, spinal cord, etc. And then we design the direction in which we will address all of these areas at risk. And then you will have a, um, a plan in which you look like, it's like a weather map where you see the hottest area is where you want it to be and the coldest where you want it to be avoided. And eventually we develop something called a dose volume histogram in which we address uh, all the structures. You can see there's a heart, the lung, the thyroid, the cord, the brachial plexus, all these areas. I mean, we try to avoid, uh, to avoid toxicity. Now it's the same setup uh, when done in simulation is the same setup during treatment. And uh, uh, we use the tattoos to, point, to put the patient in the right position and we use imaging to verify that. The treatment itself takes about 15 to 20 minutes and it's done daily, five days a week. Uh, the patient does not feel or uh, see anything. And we have surveillance cameras that help the therapist from the control outside uh, uh, the room of treatment that they can see the patient and then there's an intercom where they communicate with the patient, giving them direction, for example, about movement or breathing. And the patient, once they're done with treatment, they will not be radioactive. Um, so I divided the topics uh, simple in simple uh, four areas, uh, breast conservation, mastectomy, lymph nodes, no neoadjuvant chemotherapy, lymph nodes after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And we start with the first one, in which we don't remove the whole breast. And just to let you know that surgeons are uh, the pioneers in breast conservation. The first breast conservation was done by Sir Geoffrey Keynes in the UK. And, he, and then also we have the efforts of Bernard Fisher in the USA, and also by Umberto Veronesi in Italy, in Italy. And also you know that he's a recipient of a King Faisal uh, Prize for Innovation in Medicine in 2002. So um, you might think that radiation oncologists are pushed for breast conservation. No, it was surgeons who did. Now, one question we want when you receive the case from our surgeons is that it was complete surgery, that no re-excision is needed. We need to make sure that uh, all the, no high-risk features in terms of residual disease are present. And we have uh, uh, to your left, uh, after breast conservation surgery and after modified radical mastectomy. We have ductal carcinoma in situ, which is the microinvasive disease. And according to the uh, guidelines by the uh, Society of Surgical Oncology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and American Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology, uh, we want about two millimeters uh, being away from the cut. So we have clearance from the um, edge of the tumor to the area where it was removed. So a margin of two millimeters is recommended, but a judgment should be applied. We have certain areas in which sometimes you accept a little less if we have very low uh, risk features. Now, if we go after mastectomy, uh, according to the recent Supremo trial, which is done in uh, Medical Research Council, it's ongoing. Uh, in the UK, uh, one millimeter 
uh, is uh, the one for DCIS. Now, for invasive carcinoma, the same uh, societies, the three societies, agreed that uh, the agreement is no ink on the tumor. So we don't want to see that tumor at the edge of cut. Um, and so you want to see some few cells uh, in between. But also you need to apply uh, judgment. If you have so many high risk features, you sometimes might add, you know, uh, one or two millimeters just to be sure. Um, uh, after mastectomy, the NCCN guidelines and the Supreme trial also ask for one millimeter. So one of the questions we always receive the case from surgeons, do we need re-excision? And the answer is, there is no magic number. It is a multidisciplinary decision. People have to sit at the tumor board and decide whether this is acceptable or the patient is taken back for re-excision uh, in the operation room. Now, timing of radiation therapy. It's very important that we receive the patient without delay so that the disease would not grow, uh, regrow after uh, surgery. And in, in a, a French uh, uh, systematic review done, uh, published 2009, they recommended that the balance of all the literature is that the risk of recurrence increases after eight to 12 weeks after surgery. So if we're not planning on uh, chemotherapy, just to give radiation in early cases, uh, we should not go beyond 12 maximum. Better if not beyond uh, eight uh, weeks, otherwise risk of local recurrence will increase. Now, if the patient has to go through chemotherapy, there should not be a delay more than seven months after surgery. Now, knowing that most chemo uh, courses are given over five to uh, six weeks, uh, six months, sorry, we're talking about, about the same period, like eight to 12 weeks um, after chemo, just to avoid the increase of local recurrence. So I just want everybody to remember eight to 12 weeks, either after surgery or chemotherapy to avoid the increased risk of recurrence. Now, ductal carcinoma in situ is the microinvasive disease and the earliest form of, of cancer in the breast. And some people thought, you know, should we just, we can we do this breast conservation surgery and not give radiation? We have four trials with about 3,700 patients and a follow-up of 15 to 20 years. It, it, and the, the uh, trials are listed below. It just tells you that by giving radiation, you cut the recurrence risk by half. And that in every uh, time you have a recurrence, 50% of the recurrences are invasive, which are more dangerous than DCIS. Um, uh, the RTOG, which is an American group, tried to find the low risk uh, carcinoma in situ with the best you know, features. And after 12 years of follow-up, they found that the recurrence with breast conservation surgery uh, uh, with or without tamoxifen is 11% at 12 years, while it is 3% after the radiation. So can we omit radiation therapy in ductal carcinoma in situ? As we speak, no. Now, some uh, trials look into remove or removing radiation therapy or omitting radiation therapy in the elderly. And the elderly, because as you know, they probably will not survive that long, you know, and can they do without? And so we have uh, the CLGB and the prime uh, trial. Now, why do I have this in front of you? Just to say that we need 65 or 70 year old uh, ladies, uh, T1, which is maximum two centimeter, or if you want to take up to three centimeter. So nothing big and node negative and uh, receptor positive, and they had a breast conservation surgery and the negative the margin is negative. And they are uh, receiving or will receive a hormonal therapy that um, the outcome shows the CLGB is the longer uh, follow-up after 10 years, uh, the recurrence with those, in, those who received radiation was 2% while it was 10% for those who uh, did not receive radiotherapy, which is the risk of 1% per year. Now you make a decision whether this is acceptable or not. It is still 90% cure. Uh, the prime trial uh, is a shorter follow-up, which is five years. 
and it was the same exact results of five years of uh, CLGB. So there is a slight risk of recurrence, whether or not it's acceptable, balancing the toxicity with giving radiation and the health of the patient. So this is again a multidisciplinary decision, but also you might sometimes consider omitting radiation therapy in the elderly. Uh, now we talk about radiation schedules, and Dr. Shakir and Dr. Aklam mentioned uh, the high PO fractionation, which is shortening the treatment duration by increasing the daily dose. Now, typically patients are treated, uh, you know, in, in over five weeks daily, as we said, five days a week, so like a total of 25 treatments. But now uh, the... Uh, standard of care is shifting towards three weeks um, through the uh, uh, Canadian uh, trial and the UK trial. Um, and so patients will finish the treatment in three weeks, receiving 15 uh, treatments. Now, a more, uh, we call it modest uh, hypofractionation. An extreme form is the one week treatment uh, from a UK trial called fast forward trial. And it's been published recently in Lancet Oncology showing equivalence between the one and three weeks as three weeks is becoming the standard. And there is no much difference. And uh, me and Dr. Adnan have treated our patients in the advent of uh, COVID-19 and restriction, et cetera. And patients seem to be doing well. So uh, uh, patients can finish the treatment in one week or five days. But of course, remember, um, limited uh, just you know uh, to the best conservation uh, lymph nodes I would not advise or after mastectomy. Now radiation volume as we mentioned we have the tissue in of the breast and then we have the tumor bed where the tumor was removed. Um, we talk about additional dose to the tumor bed uh, negative markers we improve the local control especially uh, in young patients by adding an extra dose, but it might add to the fibrosis. Now, close or positive margins, uh, in this giving a boost to the tumor bed will not improve the uh, outcome as re-excision. So we need to excise because you are jeopardizing the likelihood of recurrence. So uh, giving a boost does not make up for inadequate margins. Now, there is uh, another uh, approach, which is uh, treating only the tumor bed, and uh, we call it partial breast radiation or accelerated partial breast. And we have the American and European guidelines. Patients have to be 50 years old or more. Um, the Europeans do not accept uh, ductal carcinoma in society. Americans use the RTOG low risk, you know, the trial I just mentioned, that screen detected grade one to two, less than 2.5 centimeters, um, and then margins. With DCIS, they want three millimeters for invasive, uh, two millimeters or more, and uh, no invasive lobular because usually it's diffuse and no lymphovascular space invasion. For mold status, better if it is uh, positive and no negative, and uh, no multifocal or uh, uh, no neoadjuvant chemo. So those patients can be given partial breast radiation, and it's usually there are two regimens: either twice a day, morning and afternoon, and uh, afternoon in one week or once a day over uh, maybe seven, seven to eight uh, days, either sequentially like every day or uh, like the Florence trial or every other day. Now there is way of giving partial breast, which is invasive and it can be done by bracket therapy, which is the internal uh, therapy uh, by using a balloon inside the breast into the cavity or by using catheters in which we upload uh, uh, radioactive catheters. And uh, in both ways, this is invasive. So it's, and, and uh, 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 this is labor intensive, but seems to be giving equivalent results. Intraoperative is an external beam actually, but it's during the operation. So the patients should be in the operating room with the wound open and you give to the tumor cavity. Unfortunately, randomized trials showed a little worse local control, like the target trial for the intra beam and the Iliad trial for the electrons. Uh, okay. Now, sometimes the surgeon can help us intraoperatively by marking the tumor bed, even to either to give the boost or to do partial breast radiation when we only target. And so they would surgical clips. 
um, uh, uh, it, it, the daily tracking by onboard imaging that Dr. Chakra talked about can track these uh, clips and uh, adjust so that we hit the target in the right way every day. It can be the usual surgical clips or something called biosor, which is a, um, a spiral uh, uh, absorbable area with the uh, six titanium uh, uh, you know, clips. Uh, but this is not available in every place. Any surgical clips will do. Now we talk quickly about mastectomy and the indications for radiation. As we said, we don't give usually radiation after mastectomy, but sometimes we have to because of high risk of recurrence with radiation alone. So usually T3 or more, which is more than five centimeter, N2, which is more than uh, three, centi three uh, lymph nodes, like four and above. And uh, recently in the ASCO guidelines, American Society of uh, Clinical Oncologists, any node positive is at risk uh, after recent trials. And the NCCN guidelines said margin positive. But again, sometimes we have areas in which there is higher risk. The reason I put this balance or scale in which the more high risk, the more you tend to uh, give uh, post mastectomy radiation. Um, and like age less than 40, uh, uh, T2, which is bigger than two centimeter, grade three, triple negative, lymphovascular space invasion, margin less than one millimeter, KI 67 more than 20. Axillary lymph nodes, uh, the section is inadequate less than 10 lymph nodes more than 20% positive lymph nodes, which is the node ratio, extra capsule extension. And recently we've been looking into a uh, literature about Oncotype DX more than 18. Uh, now, surgeons, we treat the scar, we include it usually, or sometimes we boost it if needed, if there are margin issues. So it's very important to not extend your scar uh, to the other breast, something like this. This is one of my patients and it was really difficult to treat. This lady um, had a scar that crossed the midline into the other breast and she ended up having another breast cancer which is here at the same time. So uh, it, it needs to be well planned knowing that it was really a difficult situation covering this uh, uh, patient and it added to her toxicity. Now, post immediate reconstruction, as you know, we reconstruct immediate reconstruction is a fact of life. Our plastic surgeons now do it during the first surgery, either by flaps, which is patient's issues, which is usually less radiation toxic because this is not a foreign body. But caution, the medical anastomosis, usually, uh, especially the, with the anastomosis, uh, as you know, the flap could be free without anastomosis or it could be medical. If it's pedicled, then usually the most or the most favorite is the internal mammary vessels and we sometimes treat it. So we might kill the plant, end up with implant failure if we don't pay attention. Now for implants, uh, usually we do a tissue expander first. So we have to stop the installation into the tissue expander during treatment so that the calculations will not be affected because we don't want to change the size. Also, we have to have special dose uh, uh, calculation because the metal artifact. And we sometimes deflate the other, uh, if we do bilateral uh, tissue expander so that we don't hit the other uh, uh, breast. Same thing for hypofractionation, but post, -ma post mastectomy. And as I mentioned to you, uh, we don't have data supporting the one week, but the three weeks is still acceptable. And we have five trials saying that it was uh, safe and uh, still limited use for lymph nodes uh, or after implant reconstruction. Now, lymph nodes uh, not having uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as you know, uh, the axilla levels one and two are sampled by the surgeons, uh, either by central lymph node biopsy or axillary dissection, but the infraclavicular or epical or level three or the medial uh, supraclavicular lymph nodes, internal mammaries, are not addressed by surgeons, and if they are at risk, we treat with radiation. And the indications to give nodal radiotherapy is based on the um, National Cancer Institute uh, trial, in which patients, you know, high risk for nodal involvement, higher stage, node positive, and high risk features like inadequate uh, lymph node dissection, grade three, receptor negative, or lymphovascular space invasion is present. 
Now we have uh, trials after the breast conservation surgery saying that you know in high risk patients we can improve local control, disease free survival, distant metastasis free survival, and breast specific uh, cancer survival. Also the same after post mastectomy, and we have randomized trials uh, or we have meta analysis in the case of post mastectomy. So um, this is very important, and we can alter the patient's outcome. Now, when we have low volume disease, which is microscopic uh, nodal, uh, and this is basically when you do the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and you have only two positive after uh, breast conservation, and it is T1, T2, and node negative, uh, we have the trial, you will hear a lot, everybody calling it the Z11, showing that whole breast radiotherapy is enough and you don't need axillary dissection. There is another trial in which it looked into axillary radiation therapy, but uh, in a way, it seems like the uh, Z11 because 82% had breast conservation and 95% had one to two sentinel lymph nodes and radiation is enough. So when you have uh, uh, cases that fulfill the inclusion criteria and plan for Z11 radiation and uh, do and no need for axillary dissection. Now, the ultra low volume, you know, with uh, hematoxylene, uh, eosine uh, stains, we did not see that. But with immunohistochemistry, now we have something called isolated tumor cells, in which deposits less than 0.2 millimeter. But those outcome is similar to not uh, negative. So we don't give radiation based on that. That's why it's called PN0. But micrometastasis, which is PN1MI, uh, deposits more than 0.2 uh, millimeter and less or equal to 2 millimeter. Anything more than 2 millimeter, we call it macro metastasis. Their outcome are intermediate between the PN uh, and the node positive. So what do we do? If we have micro metastasis, we consider radiation if we have high risk. So you see that the theme is that we keep saying high risk. If we have high risk features, we treat. Now, uh, the Last part is lymph node after neoadjuvant chemo. As you know, this is confusing for some people. The standard of care, anyone with clinical uh, node negative, who after surgery will find them to be node positive, will give radiation. And everybody who is clinically node positive will get radiation anyway. But now we have new retrospective data showing that, um, uh, again, similar to the above, Clinically N0 with residual disease in the specimen, you give radiation. And same thing for node positive clinically, but this is the difference. If you have node positive who became node negative, we sometimes call them the converters. If the original clinical uh, stage was two to three, uh, which is advanced nodes, even if they are node negative, we would give radiation. And if it is N1, uh, no radiation if, uh, again, low risk features uh, like luminal A or uh, tumor tends to be negative. Now, there are ongoing trials. I'm not gonna go through this. I will conclude by late complications and I will not say, uh, except the most serious ones. Arm lymphedema, uh, especially if lymph nodes uh, uh, are treated, uh, uh, and after sentinel lymph node biopsy, the risk is 15%, and after axillary lymph nodes dissection, it's double. This is from the Amaros trial. Radiation pneumonitis, especially if we're treating the lymph nodes or bilateral, which is larger lung volume involved, and the risk is 0.5 to 4%, still less than 5%. Now, second malignancy, especially if smoking or there are genetic risk, and the risk is one in 200 which is 0.5%. But the most talked about is the cardiac uh, side effects. And in many cases, we already have background risk, like age, uh, like diabetes, hypertension, patients' anatomy with the heart stuck to the chest wall, or systemic therapy like anthracycline, stratuzumab, arom aromatase inhibitors. All of these can affect the heart. But for radiation itself, the risk is 05 to 3.5%. And uh, it depends on the heart uh, volume radiated, radiating the lymph nodes, especially if we treat the internal mammary lymph nodes. And one of the tricks we use is respiratory gating, 
by having deep inspiration breath hold. And the, if this is the regular on the right. If the patient does deep uh, uh, breath hold that the heart elongates and the lungs are inflated and we treat this heart. Um, I conclude with this, my talk, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Dr. Rathman. It was really informative, not only to the surgeons, actually to the radiation oncologists as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have only one question in the uh, system right now, uh, but we'll uh, delay to the uh, discussion after the speech of Dr. Hassan Hajazi. Uh, I hope Dr. Hassan Hajazi will stick to the time. I cannot stop Dr. Al Uthman. He's my boss. He will stop my salary. So, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what we will, uh, uh, Dr. Hassan Hajazi, the head unit of the radiation oncology at King Abdul Aziz University Hospital, one of the oldest uh, universities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. He's assistant uh, professor. He is the uh, uh, one of the uh, heavy duty radiation oncologist, let's say. So he's going to talk about really about heavy duty things, about mm -hmm. all the GI system, the rule of radiation therapy in gastrointestinal malignancy. Wish you all the best. I don't think you will finish early. I will stop you at some point. Go ahead, Dr. Hassan Hijazi. Thank, thank you very, you very much, much for your participation. Introduction. And thanks for the, uh, for the invitation by the organizing uh, committee. I think uh, I have a difficult uh, task today because of uh, two reasons, actually. Uh, uh, giving a talk or speech after Dr. Uthman is, uh, is a challenging uh, by itself. And the other thing is that I have a, a really rich uh, subject or topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to share the screen. So do you see the my screen now? Yes, clear. Okay. Maximize the and uh, proceed. So uh, I'll be talking about the role of uh, radiotherapy in uh, uh, GI malignancies. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult now to uh, to cover everything uh, in the upper GI, which includes the esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, and the patobiliary, and the lower GI cancers, which include rectal cancer and anal cancer. Uh, I think uh, I'll be talking about the evidence-based uh, uh, the role of radiotherapy and the uh, evidence behind uh, giving radiotherapy for those uh, cancers, but I'll concentrate on the esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer in the upper GI, and the rectal cancer in the lower GI, because I think there is a lot of uh, debate, and I think it's more relevant to the uh, radiation oncologists and the surgeons who are attending this uh, session. So the esophageal cancer, uh, usually we have uh, two treatment strategies for the uh, esophageal cancer. We have whether the neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy or definitive uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy for uh, locally advanced disease or unresectable. Uh, uh, now, I, I, I think uh, we um, examined or tested uh, the role of radiotherapy uh, uh, versus the surgery, and this is one of the uh, landmark trials or uh, practice changing uh, uh, since 2012, uh, the CROSS trial, uh, uh, randomized patients into surgery versus uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy uh, followed by surgery. Most of these patients uh, uh, had uh, adenocarcinoma, and 25% uh, of them had uh, squamous carcinoma. There is also uh, some superiority, actually, in terms of uh, R0 uh, uh, rate in the arm of chemoradiotherapy, and the overall survival uh, was better with the chemoradiotherapy. When we look at the uh, 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 subgroup uh, analysis will find that the squamous cell carcinoma patient benefited more than the adenocarcinoma patients. Uh, in terms of local failure, we can find that local regional uh, progression and distant progression overall survival uh, had better results with the new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy uh, uh, versus the uh, surgery alone. And when we look the, into the tumor histology itself, we can see that the squamous carcinoma had a great benefit uh, than the uh, adeno 
carcinoma. Now, is there a role? While the uh, adenocarcinoma actually did not benefit that much from uh, chemoradiotherapy, is the chemotherapy is enough for uh, as a treatment for those patients? This is a randomized trial that compared the new adjuvant chemotherapy with the chemoradiotherapy in a new adjuvant uh, uh, setting and showed there is no uh, a significant difference between the two. So uh, we can consider the chemotherapy for the uh, adenocarcinoma patients. But this is an old studies and they were using old uh, uh, outdated chemotherapy. Now with the new uh, era of uh, fulfilonox and FLOT, uh, we can see good uh, responders actually with uh, uh, improvement in the outcome, in the clinical outcome, especially in the overall survival when compared to the old uh, ECF or MAGIC trial and uh, so is there a benefit of adding uh, radiotherapy to those new uh, uh, chemotherapy? I think we'll have this uh, uh, answer uh, with, the, with the results of these ongoing trials, uh, which compare the chemoradiotherapy versus the chemotherapy, but with the new uh, uh, chemotherapy types. Now we we'll go uh, to the definitive uh, chemorad, and the dose escalation for uh, patients with locally advanced um, esophageal cancer. Uh, we have two trials actually tested the uh, dose escalation in terms of uh, increasing the dose to the, uh, to the tumor and the esophagus uh, versus the standard dose of chemoradiotherapy. We found that uh, the chemoradiotherapy has more benefit in terms of overall survival than the radiotherapy alone, but with higher dose. In the, on the right side, this is an intergroup study where they tested uh, the higher dose, but this time with chemotherapy, and they found that there is no benefit out of this. So there is no benefit actually of increasing the dose for those patients. This is a recent study uh, uh, published this year and uh, presented last year, uh, this year in ASCO. Art Deco trial, which compared the uh, uh, higher dose of radiotherapy with uh, the standard dose of radiotherapy again, and uh, with chemotherapy as well. And we can see that there is a small benefit actually of uh, uh, adding the uh, higher dose to the uh, arm of uh, radiotherapy. But we can see that there is a pronounced probably uh, benefit for those uh, specific patients with uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma histology. Again, the toxicity was similar in both arms, so it's safe to increase the dose, but you need to choose which patient. So the takeaways for uh, points for the esophageal cancer, the preoperative chemoradiotherapy is the standard care for both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. The perioperative chemotherapy is an alternative acceptable strategy for adenocarcinoma. Uh, this will be answered actually by the uh, ongoing trials uh, in the future. And uh, there is no benefit to those escalating above 50 gray for definitive chemoradiation. I would add, except for patients with squamous cell carcinoma, there might be some sort of benefit uh, uh, by adding a uh, boost to their treatment. So what about the pancreatic cancer? The rationale for radiotherapy in pancreatic cancer is uh, with the improvement in the systemic therapy nowadays, probably will find the role of uh, local uh, therapy as radiotherapy in the uh, uh, treatment of uh, those patients. Uh, local progression has consequences and uh, uh, we probably find also a role of palliation by radiotherapy in this uh, specific group of patients. Uh, the local control is poor with non-surgical therapies, and this is a fact we need to know. So with the uh, improvement in the systemic therapy, these are uh, some examples of uh, the uh, new um, uh, uh, chemotherapy as fulfurinox or gemcitabine abrexane, uh, uh, compared with the gemcitabine as a standard arm in the adjuvant setting for patients with locally advanced or even metastatic and resectable uh, pancreatic cancer. And we can find that there is 
uh, a significant improvement in the overall survival for those patients. When we come to the role of radiotherapy with the outdated uh, chemotherapy, we find that there is no uh, much uh, overall survival in those uh, patients, especially when compared with uh, another regimen of chemotherapy. So what about the resectable pancreatic cancer? Again, with the new era of fulfurinox and uh, the results, the recent results of the superiority of gemcitabine as an adjuvant therapy for resectable uh, uh, cancer, uh, applying the same actually uh, uh, scheme as in the locally advanced cancer, we can see that there is the separation of the curves uh, with uh, a statistical significant difference in the overall survival between the two arms with even doubling uh, the median survival in the uh, fulfurinox arm. This is another study actually uh, having the same design of the uh, fulfurinox study, but replacing the fulfurinox with the uh, gemcitabine abrexane. The results were uh, a little bit uh, similar, uh, especially uh, uh, for those with resectable disease. So the rationale for preoperative uh, therapy was that surgery is curative, yet morbid. 25% of the patients who receive new adjuvant chemotherapy will develop systemic disease. And 43 to 60% of the patients with resectable disease had R R1 resection. So theoretically, when adding uh, radiotherapy as a local uh, therapy, it might provide some maximum control of the systemic disease, could provide the longest interval for systemic disease to be declared, and that allows for sterilization of the margins and increase the R0 resection. How about the borderline resectable? These are the uh, definition actually of the borderline resectable uh, disease by the NCCN guidelines, the SSO and the MD Anderson. Uh, there are some uh, difference actually, except for the major vessel involvement, which is uh, uh, up to 180 degrees. Unfortunately, there are no uh, uh, prospective rand randomized prospective studies, but we have uh, several uh, retrospective studies that showing the role of chemotherapy as a new adjuvant treatment before surgery, but unfortunately, uh, very few uh, uh, studies showed, uh, reported actually the median overall survival in their results. Same thing for the uh, chemotherapy followed by chemorad, followed by surgery. Few studies showed their results of uh, 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 overall survival. Again, this is, these are uh, uh, retrospective studies. We cannot uh, rely on uh, on them. But this is a very interesting study uh, published this year and uh, presented in Astro uh, 2018. This is one of the few randomized studies looked at the uh, preoperative pre uh, chemoradiotherapy uh, versus immediate surgery for resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. Uh, patients were randomized into upfront surgery followed by uh, uh, gemcitabine uh, in the adjuvant setting uh, versus uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy followed by surgery followed by gemcitabine. Half of the patients were resectable and the other half was uh, borderline. So the results are easy. Uh, on the left side, these the, the, the outcomes of the resectable uh, 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 disease we can see that there is no significant difference between the two arms, whether in the R0 rate, median over survival, or the disease-free survival. But interestingly, in the uh, borderline resectable, we can find there is a significant difference in the uh, R0 rate with, uh, uh, in favor of the preoperative chemoradiotherapy. And there are some uh, a slight uh, benefit actually in the median overall survival and disease-free survival for those patients with, uh, who underwent preoperative chemoradiotherapy. This is another uh, interesting uh, finding actually. They did a sub, 
a group analysis of those patients who completed the full therapy, uh, uh, who had the adjuvant chemotherapy after uh, the upfront surgery, or those who had adjuvant chemotherapy after the uh, 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 neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy uh, followed by surgery. So they excluded all those uh, patients who did not complete their therapy, and they compared apple to apple. The comparison showed that there is actually a significant difference in the overall survival for those specific group of patients uh, who completed his, uh, their treatment. Uh, uh, the median overall survival was 19.1 versus 42.1, uh, and it was statistically significant. So the takeaway points for this uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, systemic therapy has significantly improved in the recent decade. Radiotherapy may play a more important role due to the better uh, systemic control. Radiotherapy has been uh, controversial due to negative studies from older trials using outdated chemotherapy, and radiotherapy should be retested in the setting of modern chemotherapy, and also the hypofractionated radiotherapy course should continue to be explored as in the uh, previous study, which is the uh, pre bank uh, Dr. Hajazi, because the time is uh, really, we are far, far behind. If you can pick up either the rectum or the anal canal or just home take this uh, for both of them. This is the rectal, this is the final actually. Oh, uh, so please make it concise within two minutes okay. maximum, please. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, this is actually the revolution of the uh, rectal uh, treatment uh, from 1980s until uh, now. The total mesorectal is important actually because it's a site for possible uh, tumor deposits. This study showed the importance of the mesorectal, uh, the quality of the mesorectum as it uh, decreases actually the lower, uh, the local control uh, uh, also uh, uh, affected by the quality of the mesorectal excision. Uh, I'll talk about the, uh, probably this uh, uh, slide, talking about the uh, role of uh, chemoradiotherapy uh, before uh, the TME or the local excision. Uh, the chemoradiotherapy as a new adjuvant treatment has an impact actually with the patient undergo TME or local excision in the 2T3 uh, disease. So the outcome was similar in both groups. The role of radiotherapy in the TME shown by the Dutch trial, showing that there is actually significant difference in local uh, recurrence or overall survival at two years and the local recurrence uh, without overall survival uh, uh, benefit at 10 years. What about the preoperative chemoradiotherapy versus postoperative chemoradiotherapy? This has been answered by Dr. Uh, Klaus Rodel. Uh, in the German trial, it's easy. The preoperative chemoradiotherapy is better than the postoperative uh, chemoradiotherapy. It cut half of the risk of the uh, local uh, recurrence. There is no impact on the overall survival. Uh, uh, is it really uh, affecting the uh, outcome if we change the chemotherapy uh, used with the radiotherapy? This is the question answered by NCABP. So uh, patients were randomized into different types of chemotherapy. None of them showed any superiority. So no matter which type of chemotherapy you're using, uh, the uh, outcome is the same. Only with oxaliplatin, there are more uh, uh, side effects and toxicity. So it's not uh, anymore in the uh, standard treatment. So short course versus long course. These are the studies that looked at this question in the Australian study. It showed no difference between the, uh, the in the clinical outcome, even uh, uh, in the local control or the overall survival. Polish trial, again, there is no difference, but in the Polish trial, they used the oxaliplatin, so more interruption in the treatment of the long course radiotherapy again, showed a little uh, uh, significant difference in the overall survival at five years, but again, at 10 years, it tend to uh, diminish actually, and there's no uh, uh, survival benefit. 
Stockholm, this is an old study, but showing the effect of time from the interval between the surgery and the radiotherapy. Uh, so uh, preoperative radiotherapy with immediate surgery or preoperative radiotherapy with uh, 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 four to, to eight weeks uh, uh, surgery and the long course with the standard uh, interval to the surgery. Again, showed no uh, different in the uh, outcome, but all uh, post-operative complications were a little bit higher in the short course with the uh, immediate surgery. This is a new, uh, interesting, actually, uh, uh, algorithm of treatment. Now, in the, traditionally, we uh, add the adjuvant chemotherapy at the end of the treatment. Now, we bring it to the uh, uh, earlier in the algorithm of the treatment. So, whether before the chemoradiotherapy or after the chemoradiotherapy, but again, before the surgery. This is a phase two trial that showed that uh, uh, different intervals uh, from the radiotherapy to the surgery uh, by, and adding in the middle the chemotherapy. And what's interesting here that the more interval between this, the radiotherapy and the surgery, the more, the, the higher the pathological complete response rate. This is the final uh, study, which is the RAPIDO uh, uh, trial, which is the, now the uh, uh, practice changing trial, comparing the short course uh, radiotherapy followed by chemotherapy uh, uh, versus uh, chemo radiotherapy, which is the standard of care. Uh, what is interesting in the study, actually, they included all the high risk features of the patients uh, with rectal cancer, T4, T4B, uh, and two, um, mesorectal uh, uh, facial invasion or lateral pelvic lymph nodes uh, involvement. Uh, baseline characteristics are the same, high risk cri criteria also well balanced between the two groups. Surgical complications were similar in both groups, but when we look at the R0 resection, it was a little bit higher in, in the uh, experimental arm but not statistically significant. And the pathological complete response was statistically significant, almost doubled in the experimental arm. So uh, yeah, clinical outcome also showed that disease-related treatment failure was uh, uh, more in favor of the experimental arm. The distant metastasis here was statistically significant with the uh, experimental arm. This is probably due to the, adding, the addition of the chemotherapy in the interval between the uh, chemo radiotherapy and uh, um, between the radiotherapy and the surgery, local regional failure was the same, and the overall survival was the same. So, stay at home message was uh, uh, seven percent lower the disease related treatment failure, seven percent lower the distant metastases in the experimental arm, and double the PCR rate but there was no uh, difference in the three year uh, overall survival in both treatment groups. No toxicity uh, was uh, uh, noticed actually in both groups. Uh, uh, and uh, there is no difference in the surgery in the post-operative and the post-operative complication and the quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassam, for the uh, excellent summary for the role of radiation therapy in GI. And I'm really happy from the uh, audience. We reached now uh, up to 371 participants in this talks. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Majid Rahman. He's answering all the questions live to the uh, people who's asking. And uh, please uh, stay with us, all the speaker, and uh, please respond to the questions through the chatting. And this has really helped us to not to go through the uh, uh, the discussion actually, because the discussion was done during the talks, which is really one of the new things happened in my life during this webinars. Uh, so uh, if you don't uh, feel tired like me, I'm really still active. We want to go to the next speaker, if you don't mind. Is that right, Dr. Ahlam? If you have any suggestions? Please, Dr. Okay. Proceed. Dr. Iyad is, will not be with us today, so I would appreciate if you can proceed. Thank you so much. Yes, okay, well, alhamdulillah. Uh, we have uh, now uh, the first and uh, actually the second uh, talk by, the first talk actually for the second session, Dr. Rima Rajemi, assistant consultant 
uh, assistant professor at King Abdelaziz University Hospital. One of the uh, uh, fresh radiation oncologists came to the era of radiation oncology at Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She's uh, specialized in, I think, breast and uh, gynecological malignancies. Uh, one of the first uh, people participated in this talks, he's asking, what's the maximum dose to the pelvis? I told him that wait for the talk for Rebana Jamie and she will answer to you. Or if you like to answer him through the uh, system or uh, electronically. So Dr. Reem will talk about uh, rule of radiotherapy in gynecological malignancies. One of the really tough uh, issues and they gave her only 20 minutes. I hope she will stick to the time at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Reem. Please see, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adnan, for the introduction, and thank you, Dr. Ahlam, and the organizing committee for the invitation. So uh, I decided I want to stick to the time, so I cut the presentation short. Uh, I'll talk about uh, indications for radiotherapy and gynecological malignancy, uh, a little bit about radiotherapy techniques, and then if time permits, I have one or two slides on side effects of radiotherapy. So because of the time, I decided I'll say one sentence about ovarian cancer. Uh, the role here is mostly palliative. There is uh, really not much role for radiation therapy, except in very select situations. I'll talk more about endometrial and cancer cervix, uh, particularly endometrium, because this is the most common uh, cancer we see here. And then, uh, or and because the role of, of radiation is uh, more significant. Uh, vaginal cancer in one sentence, if it's in the upper vagina, we treat it like cervix cancer. If it's in the lower vagina, we treat it like uh, vulvar cancer. And uh, vulvar cancer is not common in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, and it's really less common than other malignancies everywhere, uh, gyne malignancy. But radiation does have a significant role in vulvar cancer in the adjuvant setting, neoadjuvant, definitive, or even in the palliative setting. So talking about uh, radiotherapy in endometrial cancer. So uh, endometrial cancer ranks the fourth among Saudi female according to the 2015 Saudi Cancer Registry. Uh, the mainstay of uh, uh, treatment and staging is the surgery. Uh, adjuvant radiotherapy, however, improves local control in early endometrial cancer with intermediate and high risk feature and also in the stage two and three endometrial cancer. Uh, occasionally, we use radiotherapy preoperatively to facilitate surgery if the tumor has bulky uh, cervical involvement. And uh, definitive uh, radiotherapy is the treatment of choice for uh, early inoperable, uh, um, medically inoperable uh, uterine cancer or for uh, local recurrence. Uh, of course, palliative radiation therapy can be very effective in management of pain and other symptoms related to uh, local progression or uh, distant metastatic disease. So I'll just put a summary of the major trial that shaped the management of early endometrial cancer. So the Norwegian trial in 1980 showed the benefit uh, of adding external beam radiation therapy to the pelvis to vaginal brachytherapy after surgery, which was the standard at the time. And this benefit was specially manifested in 1B grade three tumors. Uh, the reduction was uh, 20, uh, the, uh, from 20% local recurrence to 5% uh, for those who receive brachy alone. The famous GOG trial, GOG 99 trial, and the Portic one compared the addition of external beam to the pelvis versus observation, and they did establish a benefit of external beam radiation in high intermediate risk groups in particular, and they also established that most recurrences were really in the vaginal cuff. And uh, the GOG-99 has uh, uh, really established a high intermediate risk uh, criteria that will uh, all come sort of like, uh, I explain it in a few minutes. Um, this led to the second trial, the Portic 2, which was published in 2015. Because majority of recurrences are in vaginal cuff, they compared external beam radiation therapy to the pelvis versus brachytherapy alone. And it showed that for those patients, brachytherapy was not inferior to external beam. I would just like to note that the patient who had 1B, which is more than 50% myometrial invasion, and grade 3 together were not included in this trial. 
in high risk stage one, which include 1B grade three and uh, stage two, and the uh, high risk histologies include a serous uh, carcinosarcoma clear cell, the GOG249 and 43, uh, both uh, published recent, recently, showed no superiority to chemo with brachytherapy versus external beam alone. In fact, the chemo and brachytherapy had uh, worse acute and neurotoxicity compared to external beam radiation. So uh, to, to talk about numbers, so in most trials had similar outcomes. Uh, if you look at five-year local control in the GOG trial, uh, the whole group uh, had local region recurrence uh, of 4% with the addition of external beam versus 14 with observation. The high intermediate risk had 4% versus 23 in the observation arm. Uh, if you look at the uh, external beam versus vagin vaginal, uh, sorry, vaginal brachytherapy in the portic two, uh, it, it had similar uh, event uh, in the vag uh, similar vaginal recurrence events, and the pelvic recurrence was also not significantly uh, different uh, between arms. Uh, we, I would like to also state again that in most trials, 70% of the first recurrences with are the vagina, and uh, there was no difference in overall uh, survival across the trials. So really, we look at uh, uh, risk uh, uh, factors when we decide on management of endometrial cancer. So there are low risk criteria, intermediate and high risk. The lowest criteria are lower age, less than 50% invasion, negative LVI, endometroid histology, and lower grade. And then the intermediate risk criteria uh, are um, older age, uh, more than 50 in invasion, positive LVI, and grade three. Now, these are the criteria. If the patient has combination of these two criteria, she goes into an intermediate high risk or even high risk uh, category of patient. The criteria that are high risk on their own are stage two and three, and the clear cell, serous, and carcinosarcoma histology. So if a patient has all risk criteria, we, their risk of recurrence is about 3%. We offer no adjuvant treatment. If the patient has intermediate risk criteria, if they have only one, then brachytherapy alone could be an option, but also observation is a very decent option, particularly if it's age alone, or uh, grade three, one A with one A one with less than fifty percent with with no mitral invasion. Uh, at these in these patient, the observation can be uh, a reasonable option. If they have two factors, my preferred approach would be uh, brachytherapy, uh, but uh, external beam could be considered uh, um, occasionally. And observation is my least option, but it sometimes could be considered, especially if these risk factors are um, age and, uh, and like 65 and LVI. And I'll come and at, uh, I'll show you a nomogram that I like to use uh, in the next slide that helps in decision making. If patient has three factors, or if they had grade three and one B, these are the two intermediate risk factors that if grouped together will put patient into a higher risk category, I would opt for external beam radiation therapy. Uh, only consider brachytherapy in patients who had uh, full surgical staging, no lymph node involvement, and who are receiving chemotherapy. In this patient situation, you might consider brachytherapy alone. So this is a nomogram that uh, was uh, published by the Porti group. Uh, it really helps in daily uh, life decisions, particularly for this group of the intermediate risk uh, factors. So if patients say had uh, was uh, 65 or, uh, or between 65 and 70, she actually scores zero. That's although age was different between trials, uh, but here it scores uh, zero. And then say she had uh, lymphovascular invasion um, here then that's give her about a score of six. If you look at that, her risk of uh, local region recurrence is uh, for with a score of uh, six. So this is the sum of the score is about 9% risk of local regional recurrence. So here you can offer a brachytherapy. That's very, I think it's very reasonable, especially it's very low, uh, it's not toxic and it's a low profile of side effects, but observation would also be a reasonable option. When you go to the risk uh, fact, the high risk factor, so it's a bit, the evidence is a bit vague here as well. Uh, for stage two, we routinely offer external beam radiation with or without uh, brachytherapy. I almost always offer brachytherapy, um, but you can consider brachytherapy alone. Say if a patient has very low grade disease, negative surgical margin, minimal invasion, no lymph node, 
or if the patient had a radical hysterectomy, she has no other uh, risk factors, margins are negative, no are med negative, again, no risk factor whatsoever, one might even consider observation um, um, in this situation. For stage uh, three and four, uh, again, um, after chemotherapy usually, but uh, uh, one might consider uh, radi uh, radiation to the, to the pelvis with or without brachytherapy. Now, uh, again, uh, observation or brachytherapy alone sometimes is an option. According to a recently published trial by Mathieu et al., there was no benefit of adding radiation uh, therapy after chemotherapy. So um, the trial uh, overall survival results are still maturing. Um, we have other trials that showed significant uh, local control advantage. So I would uh, still offer external beam radiation, particularly if the extent of the disease in the pelvis was significant um, to, to my patient, but it's also fair to tell them uh, about this result. They have the option to refuse treatment or to take whichever decision they uh, option they like. For serous and clear cell car and carcinosarcoma, again, I would offer external beam radiation with or without brachytherapy. Uh, consider brachytherapy alone if patient had received chemotherapy, particularly for early 1A or 1A2 uh, serous or clear cell carcinos or, um, or carcinosarcomas. Uh, moving into uh, cervix cancer. So after surgery, uh, radiation therapy uh, to the pelvis with or without brachytherapy uh, improves local control and progression-free survival if the patient has met uh, the adverse feature uh, um, that was established by Sidless in his paper. And those are uh, criteria based on the lymphovascular space invasion, the depth of stromal invasion, and the size of the tumor. For simplicity, if patient has two of the three uh, factors, we usually offer adjuvant radiation therapy, uh, or if the patient has lymph node positive or positive surgical margin or positive parametrial invasion. Other, other, other than that, for 1B3, 2A2, 2B to 4A, the, uh, defend, the management would be definitive, external beam to the pelvis, with or without paraortic uh, radiation, depending on the uh, size of the tumor, the extent of lymph node involvement, and the level of the lymph node involvement, together with brachytherapy. That would be my treatment, the treatment of choice based on the famous Landoni trial. Uh, in metastatic cervix cancer patient, there's risk perspective evidence that tumor-directed external beam radiation therapy with or without brachytherapy improves outcome. So if patient had complete response after chemotherapy, I usually do offer external beam radiation uh, with brachytherapy. And again, palliative radiation therapy is very effective for bleeding, pain, and other symptoms related to uh, disease progression. Uh, moving on to some of the radiotherapy techniques. So I will not talk in detail. My colleagues have already uh, talked about this, but basically this to the left is our 3D um, anatomy-based uh, fields uh, where we draw uh, roughly the target, but we place our field based on anatomical landmark, and then we open two uh, lateral fields and anterior and posterior fields to cover our target. And this is here where we draw for the IMRT or the intensity modulated radiotherapy, where we actually draw our target more carefully. We add margin around the vessels for the lymph node, and we contour the vagina and the part of vaginal tissue here. So this is what we get with the 3D. Uh, we call it a box technique because, technique because we get a box-shaped uh, isodose distribution. This in yellow is my uh, prescription dose. And as you can see, it's not only covering my target, but also covering part of the pelvis that I do not want to cover. While with IMRT here, we're nicely shaping our uh, uh, dose to cover my target, but not the anterior abdominal or pelvis wall here. Uh, this, uh, this becomes more significant, uh, well, uh, actually, you can see this more significantly in uh, this view here, if I can find my mouse, okay. So if you look at the sagittal view here, uh, oops, uh, you can uh, see that in the 3D, my dose is reaching from the anterior pelvis wall to the posterior, at least um, like more than 50% of the dose here is reaching and is covering all or targeting all my uh, normal tissue here, while with IMRT, we're nicely sparing the uh, bowel and the bladder, uh, the anterior abdominal wall. We're also sparing part of the posterior rectal wall. It gets more significant when we're talking about periaortic radiation, and in particular, if we're aiming at giving a higher dose to the uh, enlarged nodes. 
uh, like in here. So we can easily cover the paraortic area while spreading the bowel and giving high dose to the nodes. I don't think anybody does uh, paraortic radiation uh, in, in way other than IMRT anymore. Um, and uh, the beautiful thing is that it's not only what we see, it's not only that we can nicely cover without uh, uh, giving high dose to the normal tissue, but this actually translates into clinical benefits. Uh, trials have shown that IMRT improves patient reported GI and urinary symptoms. So what's the catch? Why don't we, uh, well, like, why don't we just routinely use IMRT for everybody <laughs> and how this <laughs> Um, so if you look at the left here, uh, this is where we're contouring the, uh, so when we do IMRT, we, we uh, scan patient with a full bladder and empty bladder. And if you look at the vaginal contour here in blue, uh, it's, uh, uh, it has here in the full bladder, it's different from the, uh, it's about, it's higher than that of the empty bladder. Um, so our target here in dotted line has changed. And if I'm not careful, I could be missing a uh, target if it's the other way around. It gets even more complex with, um, with rectum because it's not easy to control rectal uh, filling. So uh, here is a relatively empty rectum. The vagina is sitting here in an empty bladder. If you uh, look at here, when the rectum is full, it has pushed the... Um, the uh, vagina contours anteriorly. If you think of it the other way around, if this was, if the vagina was contoured based on this scan and then was treated on this, we could be missing some of the target uh, if we're not uh, taking into account these motions. The other, it's, it's even more um, uh, uh, observed with the cervix cancer because the intact uterus movement is even more significant with fullness, with the bladder fullness. If you see here, the, uh, the uterus moves uh, significantly with changes in bladder fullness. Not only that, but when the tumor shrinks toward the end of the treatment, the, uh, the uterus moves more freely. It could be as significant as an antiverted becoming retroverted uterus or, or, or vice versa. So it could be very significant. So how, how do we overcome this? We carefully delineate our target to avoid any miss. We scan the patient with their bladder and, and full and empty, and then fuse both images to use all available and, and use all images, and also use all diagnostic images to estimate the daily changes in bladder and rectal filling. So if we have a PET scan, an MRI, a diagnostic CT, we use all images to help us assess the motion. And we image the patient daily before treatment to ensure that our target is within the treatment volume. We do what we call a combium CT. It's a small volume, a small dose CT, only good to, to assess the, the, uh, the, the uh, positioning of our patient. So what's the downside? That means we need longer time for CT simulation. Oftentimes we send patient, well, we, we have to send patient to empty their bladder, but sometimes we send the to empty their rectum as well. So that's a longer time in the CT simulation. It's a longer planning time. We can uh, plan a 3D uh, technique in about a few hours, um, but uh, for M IMRT, we need at least a few days uh, to ensure the targeting is good, the physics planning is good, and we have enough time for quality assurance. Uh, it means longer treatment time with all the Combium CT we do, and it uh, means the potential need for, uh, for repeating CT. What does that mean? It means increasing overall time, uh, treatment delay, and overall waiting time from clinic to start of treatment for all patients. So oftentimes I get the question by my uh, Ghanaian colleagues as why are we, uh, why it's taking more time these days to treat patients? Partially, this is why. So uh, moving on to brachytherapy. So for uh, the volt brachytherapy, for both, we are using now what we call high dose brachytherapy. So uh, it's a uh, large dose me, in a Dr. small uh, period. We are beyond the time. If you can okay. conclude within one to two minutes, please. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, no problem. So this is um, the, uh, we insert the, uh, the uh, applicator in the uh, vagina and we do a CT in our institution that to check position and then treat the uh, five millimeter around it. We connect the patient to the applicator and uh, the remote, uh, which is called remote after loader, uh, sorry, the applicator to the remote after loader and treat the patient remotely. And uh, these are the uh, uh, applicators we use for cervix cancer. 
Um, the difference is that we put the patient under anesthesia and dilate the cervix and insert the intrauterine tandem. And then if we're lucky, we get an MRI for planning. If we're less lucky, but lucky enough, but we're still lucky, uh, we get CT scan to help tar delineate uh, the target and uh, plan accordingly. And um, we get uh, plans like this, where we give very high dose. So this might answer the question of how high a dose we can give in the pelvis. So if we're doing this through brachytherapy, we can give very high dose because uh, with the uh, applicator being inside, the drop in dose is really very quick. So we can cover our treatment with high dose and then drop the dose. So we can get, reach doses to um, 80, 90 gray in the pelvis using uh, brachytherapy. Um, if unfortunately we can't always cover with the standard applicator, uh, use of interstitial needles can cover areas like this. And if we have significant vaginal involvement, we use the interstitial applicators, the others. Uh, one slide or two about uh, the side effects. So uh, these are from the recent uh, published uh, Time C trial. So uh, at the level of the adjuvant dose, we're talking about 34% uh, of diarrhea and uh, about 4% of uh, incontinence in the acute setting. At one year, less than 5% of abdominal pain and about 6% of high grade diarrhea. Uh, um, if we're talking about the, the high dose level with, in the cervix cancer, then we're talking about a urinary 30% grade two or more and 29% uh, GI. Um, the grade three uh, toxicity is lower. Um, um, thankfully, it's 7% uh, um, for urinary and 8% for GI. Vaginal stenosis and shortening are not uh, well studied, but uh, roughly it's 30% uh, in this trial and in, in the uh, embrace uh, data. That's it. I would like to conclude the one thing. Radiotherapy has an integral role in the management of gynae malignancies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation and nicely colored slides, which really describes everything. Thank you very much, Dr. Reem. And uh, let's go to the next speaker, Dr. Hossam, but not H-U, it's H-O, Hossam al assaf consultant radiation oncologist from King Fahad Medical City in Riyadh. Now we move from Eastern province to the Western province, and now we are in the central province, the most heavyweight area of radiation oncology in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Hossam al assaf the consultant radiation oncologist, have a special interest in uh, stereotactic radiosurgery and head and neck cancer radiation therapy. He's going to tell us as radiation oncologists and also to tell our colleagues in surgery about the principles of radiation therapy in head and neck cancers and head and neck malignancies. Please, Dr. Hassam al assaf concentrate about our colleagues in, the, in surgery because really the role of radiation therapy in head and neck cancer like gynecological malignancy is very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Hassam al assaf Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaykum. We'd like to thank the organizing uh, uh, for this uh, great initiative. So I think I'm the luckiest one because I'm, I'm going to talk to with the, to the ENT and head and neck surgeons uh, since they are heavily involved uh, in, in our uh, uh, field. Uh, so I asked two surgeons uh, what they are expecting from me to present in 20 minutes. It's difficult to present uh, 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 all head and neck malignancy. It's maybe 20 minutes enough to T1A glottic only. Uh, but I think together, each one of us can make a difference. Together, we're going to make a change. Uh, this is my objective, to show you how important uh, if, we work, if we work together. Uh, is multidisciplinary team care and head and neck worth it? Definitely, yes. A prospective study for 120 patients. Uh, they, are, they, are, they ask the physicians before they go to tumor board about their decisions. They found about 27% changing in their tumor diagnosis and stage and treatment plan. And, uh, uh, and more significant change in when, if it's malignant tumor, and it's mainly it was uh, an escalation of management. This show you how important the multidisciplinary team. Uh, you, saw, you saw this uh, with the, uh, my colleague presentation. It takes two weeks. It's more heavily involved in head and neck. Since that, we have pre-RT dental evaluations. Uh, uh, education, uh, prevention, and also evaluation of patient need distract, uh, uh, extractions. Maintain range of movement of uh, TMG, and also dietitian assessment. Uh, what I want to say, it's not routinely 
recommended only in high risk uh, patients or patients who are losing a lot of, of weight. Uh, we have a custom uh, 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 planning mask and we, uh, we would like to use to re reproduce the patient position. And if you see here also, sometimes you use the mouth bite to separate the area and try to save the heart palate or soft palate or also the tongue or base of tongue. Also, sometimes we color our mask for our uh, uh, pediatrics or teen patients. This is, we do it in our hospital. Some patients, they ask for a special mask. Um, uh, contouring, and contouring in head and neck is very um, uh, demanding. And we use different uh, modalities and we use the targets and organ at risk, which is uh, known as a normal tissues. We use different modalities. Uh, also, we, we use uh, the clinical examination, it's very important. So the message for all head and neck surgeons, please, we would like you to describe your legion. Your clinical description is very important. Also, we read you our, your OR note, if there is any, and also we read the pathology report, and also we need the pre and post imaging. And after all of this, we will call you and ask you uh, about your uh, intra-op finding. Uh, in nasopharynx, radiation is a curative modality. Uh, a radiation can be done in a stage one uh, by alone. Uh, chemo radiation, either induction or concurrent uh, for a uh, more advanced stage. IMRTs made make big difference in head and neck, uh, increase local control and make the failures more in systemic uh, disease. Uh, and uh, re regarding local control and also decreasing the toxicity and uh, uh, many papers showing, and one of them actually is phase one, phase three randomized trial uh, regarding sparing the, 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 the barotid. When we go to uh, the LENAC, this modulation inside the LENAC uh, and inside the head of the LENAC make big difference regarding sparing critical structures, uh, especially when you go to the head and neck, it's uh, optic chasm, optic nerve. I found this uh, a clip that's showing you a tumor between two kidneys and this modulation in the head of the LENAC giving us opportunity to deliver a high, very high dose inside, uh, inside the target and trying to spare the kidney. This principle is also applicable in the head and neck. Uh, the optic nerve and optic chasms, brainstem, they are very uh, sensitive structures and considered as a, a critical structure or important structure. That's why with this VMAT and IMRT give us a chance to re-radiate. Uh, one of the surgeons I asked, he said, let us know about re-radiation. I told him this is one lecture, but uh, there is a misconception that only, uh, they think re-radiation only for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, in this study, the, in the re-radiation study, they showed that the, the patient who got resected the tumor and the uh, recurrence of free inter for more than two years, they have a better survival. That's why most of the time we pushed more and harder uh, surgeon to do a resection if it's possible. And when the patient has uh, more than two years and resected or uh, less than two years with organ dysfunctions like a big tube or a trichostomy, they have uh, lower survival and the worst patient when the, you have a recurrence free inter for less than two years and with organ dysfunction. Oral cavity, one of the commonest, it, it, one of the common tumor we see, especially here in the kingdom, and uh, uh, surgery whenever it's possible. But definitive radiation can be done in inoperable and unresectable tumor. This is a, a, a study, a, a national cancer database analysis for about 7,000 patients. Uh, inoperable or unresectable patient showed an, an, a, a decent survival. Uh, overall survival is better in surgical patients who are receiving surgery and post op, and, and the difference between the two uh, uh, different approach is 16%. I'm not saying surgery uh, radiation is an alternative, it's an inferior option, but it's an option when uh, 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 surgery is uh, uh, impossible or for unresectable tumor. Uh, then we, after uh, uh, surgery, we, uh, we defined patients to uh, three categories. The high risk, patient who got a positive margin or extracapsular extension, also intermediate and low uh, risk. And these high risk, we give concurrent chemo radiation, intermediate risk. Sometimes if uh, we need one or two factors to, uh, to give an adjuvant radiation, but one of the factors is unspecialized surgeon. If we have uh, a surgeon that he's not specialized in head and neck, that sometimes it's, it's, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in the pathology report, and sometimes we give patients benefit of doubt. And patients with low risk, only we observe them. 
Radiation timing, uh, it's very important. In breast, if you see, uh, as you see, it's decreased local recurrence, but then radiation might decrease and offer also fifold. That's the package. This is an MD, MD Anderson uh, uh, article showing a package time, date of surgery to post-operative radiotherapy completion for high-risk patients in T3 and T4 uh, and T3. Uh, and showed in a decrease in survival and local, recur local uh, regional recurrence. Uh, 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 the same study also showed that at the time between surgery and radiation, the ideal time is six weeks. If you see here the seven weeks, there is a decreasing in, in overall uh, uh, recurrence and decrease in uh, improvement in the recurrence and also uh, improvement uh, in, if you deliver the treatment uh, within six weeks after uh, uh, su uh, surgery. Glottic cancer is one of the complex uh, treatments and mainly based on the T staging. Uh, uh, T1 and T2 radiation can cord stripping and laser excision. Uh, radiation prefers unless the disease is very superficial. T3 concurrent chemo radiation. T4A, uh, some people they divide it low and high volume. Uh, T4 and uh, surgery, post operative radiotherapy. Uh, I don't want to talk about controversies, but this is uh, as a general uh, things. Uh, uh, glottic cancer and early ones, we try to spare the carotids. Our IMRT try now, we try, if you see the hot uh, red color uh, um, focused mainly in the larynx and we try to spare the carotids since radiation might cause an, a late side effects in form of uh, carotid stenosis. Uh, continuous malignancy, these two patients I've treated, uh, radiation, uh, it's an excellent option for early and squamous basal carcinoma. Uh, skin cancer is common in head and neck. Uh, it provides a similar local control as surgery and with bitter cosmesis in some location. This patient's uh, in a critical location, if you see uh, that in the uh, 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 below the lower eyelid, we deliver in 10 fractions. Six months later, you see complete response and with hyperpigmentation that will be resolved gradually. This patient I treated uh, during COVID-19, uh, like three months ago, we give her a high, very hyperfractionated treatment. And uh, uh, last week I saw her, she got almost a complete response with a, a little bit uh, uh, high pigmentation that will improve. This elderly patient with very convenient treatment uh, uh, got an appropriate treatment. Um, brachytherapy, uh, brachy, the brachy uh, uh, therapy is delivering treatment from short distance. Uh, this is an article showing, are we doing it or are we done with it? Actually, it's mainly for lips and oral cavity tumor and head and neck. Uh, uh, but since it's very specialized and skill dependent and time consuming, also most of the time done in the OR, uh, uh, placing the needles um, uh, and a few cent a fewer centers, they are doing this. But with improvement of our technology with IMRT and SBRT, uh, and now fewer centers uh, doing brachytherapy. Palliative therapy in hedonic is different than any other sites. We're not controlling the symptoms only. Local control is an important goal. I don't want patient die from uh, bleeding or suffocation or, or uh, dying that he's not able to take uh, her or his, uh, his breath. Uh, palliation is different protocols. Uh, we try to be more aggressive. Elderly patients, we can deliver uh, radical fractionated treatment since their therapeutic ratio is shorter and then you don't want them to give them a, a high uh, side effect. Uh, when you go to retrospective papers, you see the completion rate for head and neck when you give them uh, a fractionated treatment, uh, almost like the maximum was 70%. Uh, and with, uh, with, uh, with, without any higher, longer local control, which is very important. 0, 7, 21, three fractions, uh, one week apart, uh, giving also only progression-free survival of three months, three to four months. That I, I don't think that's enough. So that's why uh, sometimes we deliver a high dose. This is a study that uh, looking for stretch tactic body radiotherapy for medically unfit patients, which provided uh, excellent local control, convenient, uh, uh, more than 10, 10, uh, 80% in one year, a local failure, and if you see here in 12 uh, months, only 17%. Uh, this one patient uh, uh, I've treated, I've seen during my uh, fellowship, uh, we delivered 45 grain, five fractions in head and neck, one year and a half after 
uh, a patient uh, got an excellent response and will control tumor. Uh, and this patient I've treated uh, in, in uh, uh, like six months ago, um, uh, uh, that uh, or September 2019, a medial canthus tumor in elderly patients. Um, we deliver 35 grain, five fraction in this very critical area. And I've seen him uh, recently. Uh, he got an excellent response and uh, without uh, very significant side effects. And his uh, vision is still intact and his cornea as well. Radiotherapy in head and neck, uh, as you hear that we treat benign tumors. Benign tumors is very common in head and neck, adenoma, schwannoma, oncocytoma, baraganglioma, also benign co condition like keloids, thyroid ophthalmopathy, hypersalivation, and tragium. Uh, this patient I've treated three months ago, uh, oncocytoma, and uh, he got resolved of his minimal symptoms that uh, compressing his airway. Uh, that that what the surgery wasn't uh, possible since that it was involving uh, part of the carotid. Uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy, uh, 20 grain, 10 fractions, and very severe uh, cases uh, give a, a huge relief. Uh, and also this one paper uh, that's showing an, uh, an hypersalivation uh, uh, for a patient with the neurological uh, abnormalities might improve their uh, uh, quality of life. Side effects, it's very common in head and neck. There are early side effects within 60 days, uh, usually with rubbed cell no for mucosa and skin, and uh, will completely resolve. And there are late side effects, more than 60 days, vascular damage, fibrosis, and uh, uh, usually these involve uh, tissue with, without the rubbed uh, cell turnover. Uh, this is an example for side effects that we define chronic and acute uh, uh, and uh, based on the location and uh, most of the time uh, based on the volume, dose, and also a number of fractions and if we use chemotherapy. One of the common side effects, dermatitis. Uh, I tell patients sometimes if it doesn't happen, uh, I will be checking our machine if it's blocked to the electricity, especially the grade one and two. Uh, and uh, when we radiate the, uh, the, the, the neck. And uh, we get moist discomation of the tumor close to the skin, and that usually happens after three weeks. And it crosses uh, rarely we see uh, in our uh, new uh, treatments, uh, especially with the te recent technology. Um, mucositis, this is one of the most common reason for treatment interruption. Uh, interruption in hidden neck decrease local control. That's why uh, uh, we try our best to not interrupt the treatment. At a higher risk with chemotherapy, IMRT and supportive measures decrease the severity and minimize risk of interruptions. Uh, nowadays, uh, please with- Please conclude. Sure. Please conclude. Osteoradionecrosis, one of the side effects, we need the surgeon help most of the time to rule out recurrence and uh, 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 treat these patients. Carotid blow out, uh, uh, one of the serious side effects, it's not common, only in the patient with re-radiation and uh, 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 patient with hypopharyngeal sites or tumor that's encasing the carotid. We, tumor, we do a tumor ligation, and recently now it's replacing the ligation, and uh, we do carotid uh, 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 endovascular uh, approach to uh, embolize the, the bleeding. So the take home message, please discuss it before you cut it. Describe it before you remove it. Tell me more in your R note. Radiation is not a toaster. Uh, both operative radiotherapy timing affect the outcome. Communication is the key for the best possible care. Uh, always I say a good surgeon knows all your best stories and a best surgeon has left them with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, please, all the speakers, uh, uh, watch the Q Q and A, and answer the uh, uh, the questions as uh, if it is directed to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan Al Assab. It was elegant presentation as usual, and uh, they left uh, Dr. Amin Al Umair. Uh, so the brain for the brain, people. Dr. Amin Al Umair, consultant radiation oncology at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. He's uh, doing head and neck uh, stereotactic radio surgery. And now he's uh, most of his interest in uh, seeing his tumors uh, radiation therapy. He will talk about the role of radiation therapy in sinus malignancies. Please, Dr. Omer, sinus malignancies, not benign diseases. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Adnan. Can you hear me? I very well. 
Alhamdulillah. Uh, and can you see the slide? Very well. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you, Ed, very much, Adnan, for uh, taking over uh, Dr. Iyad, uh, motivator job. And uh, thanks, Dr. Ahlam, for this great opportunity. Uh, this is, I believe, the last presentation, and always the last is the best, largely because uh, I managed to prepare two different PowerPoint presentations, but now I modified it uh, based on the uh, previous speaker uh, presentation, mainly Dr. Ahlam and Dr. Shakar presentation. So, Mine will be more of an uh, overview, uh, touching uh, quickly on the indication for radiation in different subtype of adult brain tumor. So uh, uh, starting with uh, high-grade glioma, focusing on mainly glioblastoma, and the most important thing is the uh, pathology or the 2000, uh, sorry, the WHO classification system. Let's go back to 2007. When the uh, 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 life was easy, it's largely based on uh, morphology. So if you have some astrocytic tumor, then uh, uh, this is astrocytoma, or you can have oligodendroglioma, or you can have mixed uh, so-called oligoastrocytoma, which been now discouraged from 2016 classification, as most of you know. Uh, after that, the pathologist will determine the grade based on the presence and absence of, of mitosis. So you might have grade two or grade three, or you can have uh, WHO grade four, more aggressive uh, type of, of brain tumor, glioblastoma. Uh, this table summarized most common glial tumor in adult that you will get in, in, in the report. You always, as oncologists, can ask for molecular, but then your communication is not with the pathologist. You need to follow it, at least in my institute, I follow it up with the cytogenetics. It's going to be reported in a separate report than the pathology because the pathology has already signed the report, and uh, this is totally different than 2016 classification when one of the main difference is that they incorporate the molecular analysis into the uh, 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 pathological uh, diagnosis. So it's not, only, it's not only morphological and with a little bit of grading. So for instance, let's talk about glioma, focus on glioblastoma, where the mandatory molecular test now is IDH mutation, 1P19Q codeletion, and the, uh, you can do ATRX uh, on, 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 on immunohistochemical staining. By this, you now, uh, in 2016, have two subtypes of glioblastoma. So the commonest subtype is the IDH wild type, account for 93% of glioblastoma, and 7 or 8% of IDH mutant glioblastoma. Of course, if the pathologist, for some reason, have no access to molecular testing, you can go back to 2007 uh, uh, morphological uh, diagnosis. For instance, you can still diagnose glioblastoma just right beside it, not otherwise specified. This is all what I need to say about pathology briefly uh, for glioblastoma, or I mean for 2016 uh, classification. So uh, uh, the treatment or the, the standard of care in treating glioblastoma, uh, as most of you know, after maximum safe restriction is to treat patient with concurrent uh, timozolomide with radiation for six weeks, followed by adjuvant timozolomide for almost six months. This is largely based on this landmark key trial by uh, Dr. Stube, uh, uh, where he randomized patient after uh, surgery to either radiation therapy alone versus uh, 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 timozolomide and the regime that's listed in this slide. And the addition of timozolomide has resulted in uh, improvement almost two and a half months in the median survival, uh, but also it's improved two, three, four, and five years of our survival. So basically, two years of our survival and timozolomide plus radiation are was 27% as opposed to 10% with radiation therapy alone. Experts who treated glioblastoma for three or four decades have always told us that they rarely uh, uh, in the past see patients live uh, beyond three or four years, and it's pretty clearly here. It's, it's only 1% living. Uh, after five years, but in the timozolomide era, we start seeing almost 10% of patients living uh, uh, beyond that. So five years of our survival is 10%. And this is this number remind me about uh, the IDH mutation status. So must have been that most of those patients have a favorable uh, IDH mutant subtype of glioblastoma, but we don't know that because they did not do or they did not perform IDH mutation analysis in this trial. But wait, what, what they did respiratory what they did retrospectively uh, in terms of molecular is that they uh, analyzed patients for MGMT status. But before that, let me talk about the methyl guanine methyl transfer enzyme, which is a, a DNA repair enzyme. 
which typically repair the uh, uh, damage that caused by alkylating agent. And temozolomide is indeed an alkylating uh, agent. Next to this gene, next to the MGMT gene is the promoter uh, gene, which is if it's methylated, then this will shut down the, uh, uh, the repair mechanism or the MGMT mechanism, uh, uh, making the tumor cells more susceptible to the, to the uh, damage that caused by alkylating agents, uh, for instance, temozolomide. Uh, so in theory, patients with methylated MGMT uh, should have a better uh, or favorable response with temozolomide. But uh, I should also mention that they went retrospectively. So, so, so basically, STUBE trial was a total of 575 patients. And among this 575 patients, they managed to analyze MGMT status on 200 patients, almost less than half of those patients. And 45% of those patients had methylated MGMT. Uh, and in theory, they should have favorable uh, uh, outcome. And it's very obvious that addition of, you can see there is large separation of the survival curve between uh, uh, temozolomide plus radiation as opposed to radiation th therapy arm alone. And you can see it uh, at two years of our survival is double for uh, temozolomide uh, plus radiation arm as compared to radiation therapy arm alone and the methylated MGMT uh, arm. Uh, what about the unmethylated MGMT? Are they st still benefit from temozolomide? And the answer is yes. The, there is a significant, uh, uh, still there is statistically significant benefit for addition of temozolomide with radiation as compared to radiation therapy uh, uh, alone. However, the magnitude of benefit for unmethylated is less than the uh, uh, benefit uh, of patient to temozolomide and the methylated MGMTR. Uh, disappointingly, uh, uh, this was the only positive trial over the last 25 years, if we go back from 1980 up to 2005, uh, where in 1980, the, uh, the, there is establishment of radiation therapy uh, treatment as the only, uh, only positive adjuvant treatment after surgery. Uh, so if you compare radiation therapy plus, uh, sorry, surgery plus radiation arm in 1980, this was superior to surgery alone. And uh, over the last 25 years, uh, years after that, this was the only positive uh, trial. So the progress in treating glioblastoma is, is very small. Uh, I should remind you that by, by this, regardless of your methylated uh, GMT status, temozolomide plus uh, radiation concurrently and digitally became the standard of care for patients less than 70 years old. So I'll switch gear and talk about elderly patients with glioblastoma where they actually have different biological uh, tumor, more of more aggressive type of, of, of brain tumor in the, in the elderly. And this slide summarized the, uh, uh, the three randomized trial that address the issue of what will be the standard of care in treating uh, elderly patients with glioblastoma. And it seems that it's dependent on where you are, the standard of care might be different. So let's start with the uh, a trial that was uh, uh, led by Dr. Wilson uh, Rowa from uh, Western uh, of Canada, from Edmonton, uh, where he actually randomized uh, patient, uh, elderly patient defined by age more than 60 years. Initially, they start with the age 65 years, but then because of slow accrual, they make it more liberal, liberal and include any patient older than 60. One arm gets the six weeks radiation. So six weeks radiation is 60 grain 30 fraction and the other arm get the short course radiotherapy, short course radiotherapy or three weeks radiotherapy or 40 grain 15 fraction. And apparently there is no survival uh, difference between the two groups. And by this, the short course radiotherapy became the standard of care. And the next, uh, you can see the publication came out before a STUBE trial and, and next logical step is to uh, uh, compare short course radiation therapy alone versus uh, uh, addition of temozolomide. And they add temozolomide exactly similar way to STUBE trial. So concurrently, then uh, adjuvantly for six months. And they get the same result of STUBE trial. So two month improvement in, in median survival. And again, uh, the methylated MGMT uh, fare best with a, a good response to the, to the addition of temozolomide, but also unmethylated, although the magnitude of benefit is less, but they still benefit from addition of temozolomide. And at least on the center that's uh, 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 included in this trial, for instance, the Canadian, the URTC, the Trump or the Australian, and interestingly, four center from Japan uh, was participated in this multi-center, multinational trial. The standard of care, uh, I assume in those country now is uh, to be short course radiation therapy plus temozolomide. A little bit uh, uh, conflicting data. So well, the, 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 this, the, the, the Scandinavian trial, so-called Nordic trial, 
They did a three-hour randomized trial in elderly patients with glioblastoma. One arm gets six weeks radiation, along we call it long course radiation therapy or 60 gray and 30 fraction. Short course radiation therapy here is defined by 34 gray and 10 fractions, so two weeks uh, radiation. And one arm gets timozolomide alone. And for all comers, for all elderly patients, this trial, the uh, 60 uh, gray is worse than timozolomide in terms of survival. Uh, 60 gray is not different than 34, and 34 gray or two weeks radiotherapy is not inferior to timozolomide. If we do subgroup analysis and see a patient who's older than 70 years old, again, confirming that uh, 60 gray is the worst. And I think, I think 60 gray uh, 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 in this trial and the previous trial just tell you it's, it's more toxic in the elderly and you should not use it because it's worse than timozolomide and worse than 34 gray. So, uh, however, Two weeks radiotherapy or 34 gray is not inferior to timozolomide alone in the elderly. Uh, the German trial did it slightly different. So one arm getting timozolomide alone, but it's different than the previous trial. So one week on, one week off timozolomide, and the other arm is six weeks radiation therapy. And there is no statistically significant difference in overall survival between six weeks radiotherapy and timozolomide. And if we categorize this patient, uh, uh, categorize their survival according to MGMT status, the better uh, survival you get is with timozolomide alone in patient with methylated uh, MGMT. So bottom line from uh, uh, all the trial uh, uh, in elderly uh, for a patient with glioblastoma is that we have slightly conflicting data from European trial from comparing timozolomide uh, alone versus radiation. We know that uh, from uh, a couple of trials that short course radiation therapy is as effective or even better than long course. And when we add timozolomide to short course, it's superior to radiation therapy alone. The decision maker here is multifactorial, but the most important thing in deciding for which treatment you uh, deliver to uh, elderly is largely based on uh, MGMT status and performance status. I'll switch gear now and talk about uh, the assist response after completion of treatment, where uh, actually this is largely based on radiographic uh, uh, assessment by brain imaging more than clinical assessment. So, and the old McDonald criteria is largely based on, uh, on the size of the, of the tumor and enhancement. So if we go with, the, with this uh, uh, criteria, then patient A, this is his baseline MRI brain after CHD and before chemo radiotherapy. One month after completion of concurrent chemo radiotherapy, we can see that the tumor is, is enlarging. So basically he's progressing. Other way or opposite uh, for patient B who had respond. In fact, with the further follow-up imaging, if you see the five-month MRI brain after radiotherapy, you can see there is now shrinkage in the tumor size on patient A, which continue to shrink. So uh, actually, the opposite is true. So patient on uh, uh, patient A had 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 a pseudo progression, and in fact, he had good response to treatment. Where actually, patient B start having more enlargement of the size of the mass and enhancement going all the way down to the lateral ventricle. Uh, uh, so, uh, interestingly, the pseudo progression phenomena has been linked to the prognosis. So, uh, 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 people think that, or initially, we thought that patient who had pseudo progression would have better uh, prognosis, like this patient who live uh, uh, at least for uh, three years. Uh, with complete response. And this is, this is true, but indirectly. So, so the progression is not linked directly to the, uh, to the prognosis. In fact, uh, this uh, uh, Italian trial that was published in JCO in 2006 has, uh, we learned a lot from this trial. So basically, if you performed first MRI one month after concurrent chemotherapy in 100 patients, uh, we found that 50% of patients will have progression. And among this progression, uh, with the further follow-up MRI, we will realize that majority of this progression are pseudoprogression. So two third out of this half patient will have pseudoprogression, where one third of patient will have true progression. So let's focus on patients with pseudoprogression. Two third of all patients with pseudoprogression, they have actually methylated MGMT. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, this uh, I think the pseudoprogression phenomena is linked directly to the uh, uh, methylated MGMT status. And this is why we, we believe it's, it might have favorable prognosis. So also what we learned from uh, all the trial of pseudoprogression is pseudoprogression is, is, is a real phenomena, it's a true phenomena, it's a common phenomena, and the recommendation to continue adjuvant timozolomide for at least three cycles. So you can confirm that this is true progression, not, not a pseudoprogression. Uh, 
I'll switch gear now and talk about uh, the tumor of the pineal uh, region. Uh, briefly, uh, so uh, the commonest is the germ cell tumor followed by pineal parenchymal tumor, which is a wide range of histology uh, uh, ranging from the least, uh, or, or sorry, for a uh, most benign WHO grade one pineocytoma that's treated with resection alone and there is no reason to give uh, adjuvant radiation therapy to the most aggressive uh, uh, or WHO grade four pineoblastoma, which is typically have tendency to spread through a subarachnoid space to have abdominal disease. Of course, anywhere in the brain, the third subtype of pineal region tumor is the uh, glial tumor. So you can have astrocytoma. Briefly, I'll talk about germinoma, where it's commonly located uh, in the, uh, 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 the pineal region, but also can be located in the supracellular, or you can have uh, both, so so-called bifocal uh, germinoma. The treatment here, uh, or before treatment, let's talk about work up here, where you need to do serum, a tumor marker, but also you need to do MRI brain and spine. Uh, also, you need to do a lumbar puncture to, uh, for, 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 cyto for both cytology and, and tumor marker. Uh, the treatment here, uh, mainly in pediatric, is induction chemotherapy, commonly uh, used in regime is uh, uh, a beep for four cycle. After that, you need to assist patients with MRI, and almost all patients will have complete response with induction chemotherapy alone. This allowed you to decrease your total dose of, of radiotherapy, but also volume of radiotherapy. So you don't need to give craniospinal radiation. You can just give whole ventricular radiation therapy. And uh, uh, this is, you can treat adult exactly like pediatric, but uh, practice in some center, like for instance, Prince Castle Hospital, they publish their experience with an adult where treating patients with creative spinal alone. So basically uh, 25 brain, 25 brain, 20 fraction CSI, or uh, CSI means treating the whole brain and spine prophylactically. And then simultaneous integrated boost to the tumor bed residual disease with margin to 40 gray and 25 fraction. And the cure rate, the, the population is, is extremely high, almost more than 10. So 10 years over survival is more than 90%. Uh, other subtype of uh, germ, germ cell tumor is the malignant thumb germinant thumb germ cell tumor, which is uh, uh, basically treated same way or same principle like the germinoma, where you need to start with induction uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and after induction chemotherapy, I personally treat with conformal uh, radiation therapy. I don't treat with whole ventricle. And I don't treat with craniospinal radi radiation unless there is CSF spread. The result still, the prognosis is good, but not as good as, as germinoma. Uh, a few minutes more talking about pineoblastoma, uh, which is histologically similar to uh, medulloblastoma, but in the different locations in the pineal region, and also have similar behavior uh, and pattern of spread. So uh, you can have leptomeningeal disease, and also the treatment should be similar. So it's trimodality. Uh, after surgery, we give brain and spine radiotherapy, so-called craniospinal irradiation, followed by boost to the, to, the, to the tumor bed. And also we use chemotherapy as well. Uh, in the next one or two minutes, I'll talk about uh, medulloblastoma, which is mainly a pediatric uh, tumor, but uh, it can happen in the adult, where, as I just alluded to, the chance of subarachnoid dissemination is almost happening in one third of patients at the time of diagnosis. This is the old way of risk stratification based on the volume of residual disease and presence of absence of CSF dissemination, but now uh, uh, we categorized medulloblastoma patients into four subgroup uh, according to molecular analysis. So you have one subgroup, which is the most favorable uh, group. They have very high five year over survival regardless of the, of the, uh, 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 of the uh, CSF uh, uh, or drop metastasis. The tumor that I see commonly in adults is the sonic dihedrog. Uh, so-called SHH subgroup. Uh, also, we can have group three and group four. Uh, and group three is by and large is the one associated with the poor prognosis. Then you can categorize a patient into different risk group based on the four subgroup as well as other factor, like for instance, the presence and absence of, of CSF dissemination. Uh, this was my uh, last slide because I know everyone is, is tired from the previous presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amin Al Amir, for the uh, excellent presentation. And uh, thank you for the participants who joined us during this period. Uh, more than 329 participants in this webinar, which is really excellent attendance. And uh, I will leave the uh, rest of the talk to Dr. Ahlam Al Duhal. Thank you so much, Dr. Adnan, for the amazing uh, moderation. You, you've been great. I would like 
all our speakers for their effort and uh, uh, for their contribution. Their talks were very great and I'm receiving really good feedback. Um, thank you for our moderator, Dr. Adnan. And thank you for our organizer, organizer who managed to do all of this for us. And a special thank for the Oncology Center and the administration of King Fahad Specialist Hospital for their continuous support. Um, as I said at the beginning, we hope that this will be a base for a continuous educational sessions, more site specific, because as we saw that many of our speakers had more information and interested to educate more, but we had the limit of the time. We didn't want to, really, it was a general educational session. We hope that in the future, in the near future, hopefully, we will arrange for more site-specific uh, educational sessions uh, for our clinic from different categories. Uh, please, if you have any ideas or suggestions about time, uh, to uh, topics, anything, we are open for um, to hear that and uh, because we wanted to, to, to make it a success. Thank you so much for all the participants. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for everybody. Nafia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.